A very warm good morning to one and all. We'll be starting with the sessions in a short while. Good morning, Good morning, one and all. Kindly make sure that your audios are muted. A pleasant morning, dear all. Warm welcome to one and all present. A word of prayer and gratitude to God Almighty for granting us health and safety during these times of pandemic. Welcome back to the final session of Exam Tips 2021 a state level review program for third year undergraduate students focusing on oral pathology and microbiology organized by the Department of Oral Pathology and Microbiology, Anu Dental College and Hospital, Muatubura. Anu Dental College and Hospital, Muatubura is the 22nd among the private dental colleges in India as per the survey conducted by the Week magazine and is also recognized as the College of the Year 2019 by the Higher Education Review magazine. We take pride to announce our very recent achievement of being accredited a B++ grade by NAC, the National Assessment and Accreditation Council. This is the highest grade for a standalone dental institution. Our students are recipients of various funded research projects under the coveted ICMR, Kela State Council of Science and Technology and Tata Trust Scholarship. Here we present before you our institution with utmost pride and dignity. We have a video to watch. History has proven, history has proven that those who dare to imagine the impossible are the ones who 
break all the human limitations. for watching. Without much ado, let us begin with the sessions for the day. We have five eminent speakers for today. Dr. Priya Thomas, reader, Anu Dental College on the topic Forensic Odontology. Dr. Mahesh, reader, KMCT Dental College on the topic Dental Caries. Dr. Jayanti P, Professor, Associate Dental College will be talking on the topic Infections. Dr. Nirupa Thomas, reader, Anu Dental College will be speaking on Osteomyelitis and Dr. Lakshmi Venugopal, Senior Lecturer, Anu Dental College, will be dealing with diseases of nerves. The first and foremost session is on forensic odontology. I am delighted to introduce and invite a great teaching laurel from Anu Dental College, Dr. Priya Thomas, reader in Anu Dental College, Moatura, with more than 10 years of teaching experience. She graduated from the VS Dental College, Bangalore in 2003 and completed her PG from Savita Dental College in 2011. She holds a postgraduate diploma in bioethics from PSG Medical College, Coimbatore. Currently is a research scholar in molecular biology with Savita Dental College. She is the highest scorer in dental materials at the institutional level for BDS and the first rank holder in KUHS certificate program in healthcare counseling. She was awarded the Best Teaching Award in 2019 at national level by the Indian Education Awards, IIT Patna. She has guided UG projects under the ICMR and Kerala State Council of Science and Technology and has various national and international publications and is also the reviewer of many scientific journals. With utmost delight, I welcome Dr. Priya Thomas, reader, Anu Dental College, to talk on the topic Forensic Odontology. We welcome you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, my dear students. Thank you, Dr. Veena, for your kind uh, introduction. I'll uh, directly go into my topic for today. I'll uh, do the share, uh, screen sharing. So my dear students, now we are uh, going to into a different topic from whatever you have been learning over the past uh, one month. So this is something very different. All these days you were dealing with clinical features, histology, histopathological features, radiographic features. Now this topic is something very, very different from what you have been learning. So this is related to your forensic odontology. Now, from exam point of view, how do you think this is very different? Now, this is a very small chapter, which is almost towards the end of your textbook, but it has its own uh, importance 
from your exams. Now this has questions. Every, every paper will have questions from this. Two questions each will be there from this chapter. It is mainly your answer briefly questions where you have uh, uh, three marks for dedicated to the question and it is repeated question. So every year, the similar kind of questions will be asked. It is repeated over the years and every year, remember every question paper will have two questions from forensic odontology. So just going on to the introduction part of it, what exactly is forensics? So forensic is basically come originated from a Latin word means forensis or in English, it means it's public or it's related to a forum. And as you all know, science is basically a systematized knowledge through you. I mean, it's a study, it's a method of study wherein you use scientific methods. So we all know, we uh, when you have gone, when you would have watched so many movies over the years and you know, there are different methods of identification, especially when a body is brought or you can't identify a dead body. So if you remember, this is a famous scene from the movie Baradam. So this is a way Mohanlal identifies his elder brother using his clothes, the sandals. So these are different techniques by which you can identify your own relative if you don't see the dead body or if you don't have the dead body in front of you. So the other methods includes all the personal belongings like the comb, the watch, the wallet, even including the danger of the person. Now, what is forensic odontology? So the definition was given by the FDI. So this is that branch of dentistry, which in the interest of justice. So remember when the word justice comes, there is some legal implications related to this field. So it has law being carried out along with this subject. So it deals with proper handling and examination of dental evidence and with proper evaluation and presentation of the dental findings. So what are the advantages of forensic odontology? Now, this is a field or a part of forensic medicine. So it is a subdivided type of forensic medicine wherein only the oral cavity is involved. So that is related to your teeth and soft tissues of your oral cavity. So why is that this part is much more important than your forensic medicine? Well, what are the advantages of using your teeth and the oral cavity soft tissues? So here... This gets preserved, the oral cavity, the tooth will be preserved in case of burnt or decomposed bodies. You know that the teeth will be there. And especially these parts are preserved in case of mass disasters. You can recover the teeth from mass disasters. And also the oral cavity will allow you to recognize signs and symptoms of human abuse. It has a lot of importance even in crime or theft cases. So. And another thing is that any identification here, remember all individuals are unique. Even if it's for the teeth, it is unique to each individual. And even the anomalies, which is present, if you remember the developmental anomalies, it's unique to a person. And also the acquired artifacts. So acquired artifacts here pertains to the use of dangers or removable partial dangers, implants. It is going to be different for each person. Now, moving on to the methods in forensic odontology, these are the different methods which is used. So identification from dental DNA, age estimation, palatoscopy, bite mark analysis, keloscopy, dental profiling, which includes both metric and non-metric methods. So metric means where you're going to calculate and non-metric is by looking at the morphology. So all these things, the different methods has been asked individually for your exams. So everything here has been repeatedly asked in your exam paper. So these are reliable methods, which I've already said, looking at the teeth, you can identify, looking at the Ruge pattern, your DNA, and there is something called as, just like your fingerprint, there's something called as amyloglyphics, a tooth print. So on the tooth, you have different patterns on the surface, which we call as tooth prints, which is unique to an individual, similar to your fingerprints. Then your lip prints, and even using the sinus, that is from the radiograph, by looking at the sinus, you, do, you can identify a person. So the next thing which is there is dental profiling. That dental profiling means 
you include or basically it includes the extraction of ethnicity gender and age so by the word dental profiling it has three things in it one is you can derive the ethnicity you can identify the gender of the personnel and also you can do an age estimation of the person now ethnic origin will be related to the genetic and the environmental background in which the person has brought up so that is going to be reflected in the oral cavity especially on the tooth surface so by looking at the morphology you can identify to which background the person belongs so basically as i've told you dental profiling is a triad wherein you can identify the ethnicity by looking at the morphology of the teeth the next set which you have to look into dental profiling is sex determination and the third part of it or the third aspect of dental profiling is age estimation now these are the de non metric dental features that is the morphological aspects so these are few things which you can look at the teeth and look at the morphology of the teeth one is shoveling now shoveling is mainly common to your incisors that is basically if you look at the marginal ridges you can see the different incisors here in the picture you can look at the mesial and the distal marginal ridges there is a lot of variations so you can see the thickening of the marginal ridges as you go from number one teeth to the last teeth here so this way you can identify the person next is the extra accessory cusp which is present on maxillary first molar that is your cusp of carabola even that is a trait which is unique or it's going to vary from individuals to individual the other thing which you can look is the mandibular molar group pattern the three cusp of maxillary second molar so here what happens is the distopalatal cusp is going to disappear so each person again it's going to vary related to the distopalatal cusp and four cusp on your mandibular first molar so as you have already studied it is mandibular first molar will have five cusp but you can have a variation wherein you can have four cusp so see these are different patterns or traits which you can observe morphologically by looking at the teeth the next thing is sex determination now this has been individually asked for your exam so in sex determination the main thing which you have to focus is the morphology of your craniofacial area or the skull then the mandible the tooth measurements so tooth measurements the size of the teeth can be used to determine whether the person is a male or a female and the next apt method is by dna analysis so sex determination can be otherwise called as sexing so this is a word which is used for sex determination that is sexing like i've told you the most important way of determining the sex is by looking at the craniofacial morphology and the dimensions so here you have to basically look at the skull and at the mandible and these are different traits which can be used to identify whether the person is a male or a female so these are six traits which has been listed that is a mastoid process the supraorbital ridge the architecture and size of the skull zygomatic arch extension nasal aperture and the gonial angle of the mandible so these are six traits by looking at it and by uh, looking at the measurements of these traits you can say whether it's a male or a female then the other two methods are basically the supplementary methods or added on methods to the craniofacial morphology so that includes the size of the teeth so we already know females have a smaller teeth when compared to the males so you can measure the mesiodistal and the buccolingual dimensions now these dimensions remember it is population specific it varies from population to population it can vary from region to region and it's going to be different for the males and the females so under tooth size there is something called as the dental index so that is basically your canine index mandibular canine index where the mandibular canines are taken into consideration and this is calculated by using the mesiodistal crown width of mandibular canine divided by the mandibular interarch canine width so this is a way you calculate mandibular canine index so this is one of the methods which can be used to determine whether it's a male or a female the other supplementary method is dna analysis now dna analysis here what you can do is there is something called as the amlex gene which is located to the x and y chromosome now this gene is a one which codes for your amelogenin 
your enamel protein. And this is basically located to the sex chromosome. That is, it's going to be present on the X as well as a Y chromosome. Now, since it's located on both the chromosome, how you're going to identify whether it's a male or a female? So if it is a female, you will have two identical MLX gene, two same ML gene on both the X chromosome. If it is a male, these two genes are going to be non-identical. So that way you can determine whether it's a male or a female. So if it is a female, it's going to be identical genes. Or if when it's a male, it's going to be two non-identical genes. So why DNA is considered for forensic identification? Now, remember, tooth is an excellent source for DNA. And especially when in mass disasters or plane crashes, remember, teeth is going to be preserved. So it can resist extreme condition. And where do you get this DNA? So from the tooth, which all parts will can give you the source for the DNA. So mainly it's going to be the pulp tissue. And the other areas where you can derive the DNA is from your cementum and dentin. Why? Because they contain cells. Cementum, the cellular cementum contains the cementocytes and your dentin is going to contain the odontoblast. So these are areas from which other than the pulp, you can derive the DNA. And once you extract the DNA, you can subject it to a polymerized chain reaction, a PCR, and do a DNA amplification and then identify whether it's a male or a female. So the advantage of using this technique is you don't need an anti-mortem data. Anti-mortem is that you have already the data with you and you're just going to compare the data derived from that person. So here, as such, just to know whether it's a male or a female, you don't need an anti-mortem data for comparison. The next important portion for you is on age estimation. Now the questions, it has been repeatedly asked. These are the different questions which has been asked over the years. So one is dental age estimation methods, histological age estimation from tooth, third molars, the importance of third molars in age estimation, Gustafsson's method of age estimation, and Demrijan's method of age estimation. So three things they've asked individually from the different methods that you have for age estimation. So these are the questions over the past years, which has been asked for your exam. Now, dental age estimation, basically the life of a person is divided into three, uh, three phases. You have a prenatal life or a neonatal or early uh, postnatal life. Then you have an adolescent stage. And finally, the adult stage. So in prenatal point, you have to look for the mineralization, the amount of mineralization that has happened on the tooth. So it can be done by using a radiograph or a histology, that is by looking at the neonatal line or by taking the dry weight of the mineralized cusp. In children, you check by looking at the radiographs, again, looking at the amount of calcification and adults there are a lot of other methods. So these are the different methods which are used for dental age estimation. That includes by looking at the morphology. So you can do a morphological examination and tell what is the age by looking at the radiography, by looking at the histological aspects. And there is something called as a biochemical estimation that is related to your carbon dating. So, or you can have a combination of all these techniques. So there are methods wherein which has a combination of all these techniques and then you, you can calculate the age of the person. So these are different methods. Demerijan's method, third molar, and Shore and Masler's methods are different methods, which is mainly used for age estimation in children. Then Gustafin's root dentin translucency, incremental lines of cementum, pulp to tooth area ratio. These are methods used for age estimation in adults. So it has been divided, the different methods has been divided for age estimation in children. And these are the methods for age estimation in adults. And then you have the other category, which is your biochemical method. So moving on to the first method, that is the Demerigence method. Now here it's basically a radiographic assessment. So you use a radiograph to assess the age of the person. And the most commonly, the teeth which is used here or which they are looking in a radiograph is a mandibular left teeth. So this is a method which is practiced in children. And here on the radiograph, the calcification of the teeth, 
is divided into 10 stages and it's given a score from 0 to 9. So remember, the entire stage of tooth development is going to be categorized into 10 stages and the scoring is from 0 to 9 where zero stands for no calcification or calcification is about to begin. Approximately a score of five where the crown is completely formed and you give a score of nine when you have the whole tooth being calcified or the whole tooth formation is complete. So wherein the root completion is going to be over. And then once you give the score, the amount of calcification which you assess on the radiograph is going to be compared with the developmental stage. So you have the developmental stage that is going to be compared with that. And then you assign a score, something called as a maturity score. Now the maturity score is going to be based on this developmental stage. You're going to see on the radiograph, you give a score that you compare with the developmental chart. And that score, finally, what you get is called as a maturity score. And you have separate charts for males and females. So you have two charts, one for males and the other one for the females. And then finally, you calculate the total maturity score. So total maturity score is going to be the sum of all the scores for eight teeth. You can calculate for all the eight teeth and you get a total maturity score. And the age is calculated by using the regression formula. So there's a formula for calculating age. So you put your total maturity score into that and you can calculate the age. So this is the chart which is there for all the tooth. So this is the radiographic and this is the histological developmental stage. So you compare each and then finally you give the maturity score. The next important question which has been asked is the third molar in age estimation. Now third molar is only a valuable indicator for the age 16 to 20 years. And you all know the development of the molar happens towards your adolescent age. So this is basically an indicator for juvenile and adult stage. So before 18 and after 18, before 18, it's going to be a juvenile stage. And after 18, it's going to be con considered as an adult status. Now here, this has a value or this is used. This method of age estimation is used when the person doesn't know the age, when there is no valid document with a recorded age available. So in this case, you can use a third molar for age estimation. And this has a legal implication. Why it has a legal implication? Because if the person doesn't know the age, you can categorize the person as a minor and the major. You can put it under juvenile. So if a person has come with some kind of theft or crime and the age is not known, the punishments for the minor is going to be different in the court of law and the punishments for the adults are different. So by this, you can categorize whether the person is going to belong to a juvenile category or whether it's an adult category. Then another advantage of using the third molar is mainly for people suffering from amnesia and also it has an anthropological importance. So this in short is only required for your three marks. The next method, which is there, is the Shaw's and Maslow's method. Again, this is an age estimation for children and adolescents. Now, this is going to describe 20 chronological stages of tooth development. The first method which you study was 10 developmental stage. Here, it's going to be 20. And it's going to start from five months intrauterine to 21 years. And this is based on histological section. So this type of age estimation is going to be based on your histological or ground sections. The next important method for you, which is there, is the Gustafsson's method. But this kind of age estimation is based on two aspects. One is on the histological aspects, that's on the ground sections. And the other one is by looking at the morphology. And you have many criteria for calculating Gustafsson's index, that is, based on the regressive changes which is happening on the tooth surface. So these are different criteria which are used. First is the attrition where it is uh, labeled as A. Secondary dentin deposition, it's labeled as S. Periodontal ligament status. Cellular cementum deposition at the root apex. Root resorption at the apex and root dentin translucency. So these are different criteria which is uh, looked or different parameters which are used. Now, if you look at this picture, these are graded. All these criteria are graded from zero to three. You have four scores being given. That is from zero to three are the grades given. Now, if you look here, look at the attrition. Here, there's no attrition, so it's graded at zero. 
slight amount of attrition which is present in the enamel only graded as one. It is reaching to dentino enamel junction graded as two. And then when it reaches across the DEJ, you grade it as three. And here, pulp, the secondary dented deposition, remember it is always towards a pulp chamber. Now you can see this black area here. This is your secondary dentin deposition. Periodontal ligament attachment is calculated on the basis of clinical aspects. So when the patient comes to you or before extraction, you have to calculate the periodontal uh, attachment. And then next is your cementum, cellular cementum deposition, which is going to be at the apical area. So if the thickness is very, very greater than normal, you have to give a score of three. Then the root resorption again from the apex and root dentin translucency. Root dentin translucency is where if you remember, it is called a sclerotic dentin or transparent dentin, which is basically an eight change, eight change starting from the apical portion. So if you look here, the dentinal tubules, it looks very, very transparent. The dentin is going to look very, very transparent, which is going to start from the apical area to the coronal area. So the grades, as I've already told you, it is assigned from zero to three. And finally, all these parameters, you have to give a grading and you get a total score, which you call it as X. Now, increase in the total score is, go is going to tell you that the age is going to be greater. And using the formula here, which is present, that is 11.43 into 4.56 into the total score will give you the estimated age of the person. Now, there is a modification in Gustafsson's method because they found a lot of errors when it was applied to the Indian population. So it has been modified. And instead of four grades, which was there, seven grades were given to all these parameters. So it was like half of 0, 0 0.1, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, and 3. So these were the grades. And there is a formula which, found, which was found to be much more accurate than the original Gustafsson's method. The other age estimation methods include root dentin translucency. Now, this is similar to what you read for the uh, Gustafsson's method, that is your sclerotic dentin or the translucency of the dentin. It starts during the third decade, that is from 30 years above. It will start from the apex, it will increase or it will go to coronal portion. And the translucency, like I've already told you, is going to increase with age. Now, here you have to measure the length from the apical area to the junction of translucent and non-translucent non zone. Using a software, you can measure the length of translucency and that is put into the formula. And you will get the estimated age. So here T stands for the length. Using the formula, you can calculate. Now this has a disadvantage. It's that the junction between the translucent and the non-translucent area might be irregular. So it becomes very, very difficult to give you the approximate or the correct length. So that way it has a disadvantage. Next is by using the incremental lines of first, uh, acellular cement, and that is your incremental lines of salter. So you have to find out the number of incremental lines. So number is calculated by X divided by Y. X is the total width of your cementum, of your acellular cementum. Y is the distance between two incremental lines. So you will get the total number of incremental lines that is put into your formula. That is estimated age is equal to N plus T, where T stands for the eruption age of the tooth. Here, again, you have to know the eruption age of the tooth. So this will give you the estimated, uh, the chronology of the tooth. So this will give you the estimated age of the person. And here one disadvantage is that you can have a variations in the number of uh, incremental lines of uh, uh, salter because each person, the number of lines can keep varying. And it can be only done. This is an histological section. This is done in an histological section. So you need either an extracted teeth or a dead personnel to calculate or use this method. So that is another disadvantage of using this method. And the next method is a completely radiographic method where you look at the secondary dentin deposition. And remember that secondary dentin deposition again increases with age where the pulp, uh, the size or the volume of the pulp is going to decrease. So here you're going to use pulp tooth length, pulp root length, and you can calculate the age by using 
a software. Basically, you calculate the length or the area ratio by using a software that's called as the AutoCAD software, and then calculate the age using a regression formula. So these are different methods, but you have to know, because in case they ask you dental age estimation methods, you have to list down all these methods. And in brief or in short, you have to describe the other methods. Biochemical, again, it's similar to using chemicals for your age indication. So these includes two things here, that is amino acid resumization. So remember, you have aspartic acid, which is present in dental. So here, there is a conversion between L-aspartic acid to D-aspartic acid. So the constant change, there is a constant change and there is a constant uh, change happening between L to D ratio at different ages. So different age group will have a area or a ratio between L to D conversion. So this, again, you can use for age estimation. And then finally, it's your carbon dating. So this, we all familiar. So carbon dating is a method by which you can do an age estimation. Now, disadvantage of it's very, very expensive to do, and it requires a lot of expensive equipments. The next thing, important aspect for forensic is your palatoscopy or rugoscopy. So this has been asked in the uh, past years, again, as a three mark question. Now, palatoscopy is basically a rugoscopy is related to the palatal rugae pattern, which is present on the palate. So again, remember, it is unique to an individual. No two individuals will have the same kind of rugae. And why use a palatoscopy? Okay, why you can use uh, the rugae pattern? Now, remember, it has a unique position. It is inside your oral cavity. It is protected from trauma completely and also from high temperatures because you have a lot of protective tissue surrounding the palatal rugae. You have the lips, you have the cheek, the tongue, the buccal pad of fat, even the teeth and the bone. It's going to preserve the structure. So even in a mass disaster or in a bomb blast, this structure will be completely preserved. And another advantage of using this method is it does not demonstrate any age-related change. So as a person ages, it does not show any change. And these patterns can be also recovered from your dangers, your maxillary danger uh, or any old dangers, which can be, which is recovered from any signs of cre uh, any uh, crime scenes or any mass disasters. You can take a model or pour a cast out of it and then do a palatoscopy. So these are few parameters which you have to use when you're doing a palatoscopy or a rugoscopy. So you have to estimate the total number of rugae pattern. So the number of rugae can be divided based on three things. That is based on the length, that's primary, secondary, and fragmentary. You have to look at the shape, the direction, and there is something called as a unification of the rugae. How do you go about doing this is by taking a photograph or you can take an impression and pour a cast and on the cast you can study the rugae pattern or you can use a software to study the different rugae patterns. Now this is how you go about estimating the different rugae pattern. So based on the length, you have to divide it into primary, secondary and fragmentary. So if it is greater than 5 mm, so always remember whenever you read a palatal rugae, you have to start from the midline and your ending point is towards the teeth. So remember the starting point for anything will be from the midline and your end point is towards the teeth or towards the gingival aspect. So here length of the rugae, if it is greater than 5 mm, it is considered as prim primary. If it is secondary means it is 3 to 5 mm. Fragmentary is less than 3 mm. And if it is less than 2, you, you don't need to consider the rugae. So, Based on this, you have so many rugae's on the palate. So based on the length, you calculate it and separate it as primary, secondary, and fragmentary. And then you calculate the number of primary rugae, the number of secondary, and the number of fragmentary. Then by looking at the shape of the rugae, you have so many types of shape. It can be a curved. Now curvature is when you have a single bend, a single smooth bend along the rugae pattern. So if you look here, this has got two bends here. This rugae has got just a single bend. So that can be considered as a curved pattern. Wavy is when it is kind of a sinusoidal shape or when you have more than two bends on the rugae. So two bends means it's considered as a wavy pattern. Straight is direct, straight line from origination, origin to termination. 
and circular is when you have a ring in the center of the rugi or anywhere on the uh, along the length of the rugi if there is a ring present then it is considered as a circular rugi then the direction is like i've told you it should be always the origin of the rugi should be considered from the midline so from the midline you see the origin and you see the termination now if the termination point is higher than the origin then it is considered as a forwardly directed or a positive rugi that is the termination point is going to be higher than your origin if it is lower than the origin if the termination point is lower than the origin then it's a negative angle if it is in the same line it is a zero angle the other feature which you have to look is unification of the rugi now this is where two rugis with will either unite or one rugi can split into two so converging is where again from the origin if you have one rugi converging towards that is from from the center you have the rugi converging it will be converged towards the other side towards the lateral aspect that is this this is a diverging rugi for example you see here from the origin it is going to split as two that is considered as a diverging rugi again here from the origin it is splitting as two it is branching out then it is a diverging rugi here when two rugis converge as one towards a termination it's considered as a converging rugi so here what you see on the photograph this is a converging rugi that is two rugis will join and become one towards a termination it's converging when one rugi splits into two towards a termination that is these two rugis here it is considered as a diverging rugi next we'll move on to the other aspects of forensic odontology now this is so all this was related to either gender estimation or uh, basically the mass disaster things now this is related to crime investigation so there are two methods which can be used for crime investigation that includes a bite marks as well as a lip print now bite marks has its importance especially when it comes to abuse both child abuse domestic violence or even sexual abuse again when you look at the question paper now these questions has been repeatedly asked you see the number of years it has been asked so bite marks lip print has been asked in almost all the years and it is a repeated question so when you write an answer for this you try to put the entire bite marks into these subheadings either as definition classification the use advantage disadvantage and finally how do you go about analyzing the bite marks now what is bite mark so bite mark as given by mcdonald it's a definition which is given by mcdonald it is a mark which is caused by teeth alone or in combination with other mouth parts so it can be the tooth alone which you will see on the surface or you can see the pressure of the tongue or the lips along with these tooth imprints so these together in combination will give you the bite mark now this is basically when you look at bite mark it's a type of dental pattern injury there's a pattern being formed during this injury so that is why it's called as a dental pattern injury and by looking at at a pattern in general when you look at a pattern you can determine what is the cause of this injury for example if you look at a knife stab if you look at a stab you can tell from how or which instrument has been used for causing that injury so similarly looking at this injury you can tell whether it is a human bite or even you can tell whether it's an animal or an insect bite so that is why it's called as a pattern injury and from this pattern injury you can determine the instrument or what the or the agent that has caused the injury you have classifications for bite marks so one is given by mcdonalds mcdonalds is divided into three uh, classifications so or three uh, areas wherein you have tooth pressure marks the tooth pressure marks is you get the pressure of the teeth on the surface so it could be the incisal or the occlusal the biting area will be present so you can get the incisal edge or the occlusal surfaces of the tooth on the skin the next is a tongue pressure marks that is the accessory tissues other than your teeth you can get the pressure of the tongue against these tooth imprints and then it can be just a scrapings 
that is just an abrasion other than a uh, uh, depth imprint the imprint of the teeth in depth other than that you can just get a scraping of the teeth it will be a just a mild bite would, which would have happened so you can get a tooth scrape marking especially the anterior teeth which will be in the form of scratches or in the form of abrasions now the second classification which has been considered is a camerons and the sims classification wherein it can be you can distinguish who the agent is whether it's a an animal bite or whether it's a human bite and also the kind of materials which is used for biting so it can be the skin or the other materials or the food stuff so this will give you a classification on who the agent or what has caused the bite and what kind of food the bite is or what kind of materials the bite has been present the other category or the other classification is your webster's classification now this is related on food uh, food stuffs so this classification is based on the print that is left on the food stuff now this is usually very common in theft if you remember you have some robbers entering the house if they see an apple they can bite the apple and leave the print there so this way by looking at the food stuffs you can come to a uh, uh, conclusion who the person or who the i mean which person has committed the crime if you have a suspect then only you can conclude so remember in these cases you should have your suspects and finally you have to match the data which you have got with the suspect so here in type 1 it is basically on hard chocolates if you look here the limitation or the penetration depth is going to be very very minimal now this is basically related to hard food stuffs then is you have some amount of indentation present that is especially the bite marks on something like your apple and the other one is where you have a complete penetration of the bite this will be in related uh, related to soft food stuffs very soft especially your cheese or banana where you have the penetration uh, where you will get a complete penetration of the teeth so based on different types hard soft and completely soft food you can get the uh level of penetration will be different for each food stuff the advantages of using these bite marks remember every person the arrangement of the tooth the size of the tooth the art size everything is going to be unique to an individual no two individuals will have the same kind of arrangement or the size of the tooth or the contour of the arch and again within the oral cavity there'll be a lot of variations you can have missing teeth you have a, an implant in the uh, or you can have a decayed teeth so the mark is going to be different for each person based on the morphological characteristics characteristics which is going to be present inside the oral cavity how are you going to identify this now when you're going to identify this you have to categorize as per these headings you have to look at the gross feature first so whenever a person comes to you with a bite mark look at the gross feature look at the shape of the bite mark whether it is the overall shape basically whether it's a circular or an elliptical shape whether in the center area you have redness or ecchymosis whether you have both the lower arch and the upper arch present so you have to look at the entire morphology of the bite mark then you look at the class features that is for each you look at the teeth so that is the incisible incisors will have a definite outline it will be almost rectangular in shape canines you remember it's a cuspid so the tip of the canine will either produce a triangular uh, indentation or even a rectangular indentation premolars molars the cusp tips are present so it will be more of a spherical or a point based indentation on the skin area then after that you go for individual features so first you look at the overall area then you look at the class features of the tooth then you look for individual areas like fractures of the tooth rotation the amount of spacing between the teeth and finally you look at the site where the mark is present now by looking at the site where it's present you can come to a conclusion whether it's a sex uh, sexual uh, abuse or whether it's a child abuse sexual abuses remember always a bite marks will be present either on the breast area or on the neck or it will be towards the inner aspects of the thigh so these are areas which will give you a direct indication that it's going to be a sexual abuse so using the sites you can identify whether it's just in domestic violence or whether it's a child abuse or whether it's going to be a sexual abuse 
Then next is you have to collect the entire evidence. Now, how do you about, go about collecting and uh, keeping these evidences is by normal techniques. You do a photography of that area. You swab that area. Now, this is a good method. When you swab that area, some amount of saliva will be present in that bite area. So you collect the saliva and send it for DNA analysis. You take impressions of the bite area. Okay, if it is a dead victim, you can excise that area. You can remove that area with the bite mark. And then you take an impression and pour the cast out of it. So these are different methods by which you can collect evidence. Then once you collect the evidence, once you analyze it, you do a complete analysis of about the bite mark. So there are different methods by which you can do an analysis. Either you can use a software, you can use a caliper to measure the distance. You can see the pattern which is present or you do a direct method. Direct method is you have the suspect, you know who the suspect is, take his impression, compare it. And then indirect method. Indirect method is you take a photograph uh, by using a software or by using your Adobe Photoshop, you have the photograph and that using the suspect's photograph, you have to superimpose, uh, superimpose both the images. So that is an indirect method of doing it. And finally, you give a concluding or a conclusion to your entire evidence that you have collected. So this will go to the court of law. So this is basically for saying that the person whom you're suspecting is a suspect so you know for sure then you give it as a definite biter a possible biter or probable biter that means some amount of specificity is there possible biter it could be you're not sure and then you know for sure it is not the biter the last part of what you have is kiloscopy or lip prints again asked over the past years it's a repeated question now, keloscopy is a study of lip prints. Again, you divide it as definition, classification, advantages. Okay. So, lip prints, if you, the definition of lip print, basically the lip print are lines of fissures, which is going to be present in the zone of transition on the vermilion zone. Okay. And these are groups, which you can call it as sulci labiorum. Now, what are the advantages of using lip prints? It is again unique to an individual. Just, just, just like your fingerprints, these lip prints are also unique. They are heritable. And they will give you a direct link to the suspect if it is present at a crime scene. It can be recovered after days also. But bite marks, there is a disadvantage. After a few days, the bite mark is going to disappear because of the elastic nature of the skin. So you cannot determine a bite mark and keep it for five days to look at it. But lip print is not like that. It can be recovered after so many days also. And you can identify it will start developing at the sixth week of intrauterine life. It is going to be permanent and unchangeable even after death. So one way, this has a lot of advantages. What are the disadvantages of using lip print? Now, in case of trauma, if there is a severe trauma to the lips, there'll be scarring. So obviously, the prints are going to disappear. Then if the person has undergone a surgical correction of the lip for cosmetic purpose, if there is a surgical correction done, again, it's going to affect the size and shape of the lip. And another thing is when you're recording the print, remember this is in the zone of transition. It's a very mobile area. So if you don't apply correct pressure, the print can change. So you have to be really careful when you're recording the print because these prints are present in the zone of transition and highly mobile areas. Now, where is the application of this? Again, sex determination. You can identify a male and a female by using these limb, uh, lip prints, crime investigation, theft cases, sexual abuses. And also you can use for personal identification. Like I said, it is unique to an individual, just like your fingerprint. So this method or this print can be used for personal identification other than it. So it's an adjuvant technique to your fingerprint. This is the way it has been classified. Now, prints are classified based on Suzuki and Suhachi uh, technique. You have so many types here. So type one is a complete clear cut groove running across the entire length of the lip. So it is vertical groove running across the entire length. Type one dash is short vertical grooves. See the length difference. This is short vertical groove. Type two is branched. Type three is intersected grooves. Type four is, it has got a reticular pattern or a matted pattern. 
And type 5 is which does not fall into any category, which has been here from 1 to 4. So which does not fit into 1 to 4 is called as undetermined type. Now, how you go about recording these lip prints? Take a photograph. Next is you can do a lipstick application. So you apply a lipstick and then finally copy the print onto a cellophane sheet or a, onto a butter paper. And other than using a lipstick, you, there are many methods that is using a fingerprint developing powder or a dusting powder. So if it is left on a glass, if the print is left on a glass, you can use a fingerprint developing powder or dusting powder and you can record the print from the glass or use a magna brush or a magnetic powder. So these are other methods by which you can record the lip print. But this is a way of recording the lip print in a normal case, that is apply a lipstick, use a cellophane sheet, give uniform pressure, and finally peel the cellophane sheet and transfer it onto a paper, and then use a magnifying lens, you read the pattern which is present on the lip print. So this is a way you identify you have to measure for it. The, the entire lip print has to be measured for its length. Then you divide it into quadrants and each quadrant you as, uh, assess the pattern which is present using a magnifying lens. So coming to the end of the entire forensic odontology, these are different uh, questions which has been asked over the years. Like I've already discussed as it is. So over the past question papers, these are different questions which is done. And remember every year, there is going to be two questions. So if you know this so much, you can get directly score six marks in your exam. So this is a way to go about answering. Remember, it's a short answer which they ask basically the brief questions for a three marks. So try to include everything possible, but in a point wise manner. So this is a way, this is an example given for bite marks. So you write the definition. Classification, you need not include all the three, but at least a minimum of two put it there. The use, what is the use, where it can be used, the advantage, the disadvantage, and how you go about analyzing the bite marks. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Priya ma'am, for a very informative and interesting session. Now we are moving on to the next session. The topic is infections. Introducing the speaker. I am privileged to introduce the next speaker of the day, Professor Dr. Jayanti P. She completed her BDS and MTS from Dr. MGR Medical University and has received three gold medals during her undergraduation. She was a university topper in MDS oral pathology in 2007. At present, she is working as a professor at Assisi Dental College, Kollam. She is passionate about teaching and has trained more than 1,000 students for MDS entrance examination in five different coaching centers across the country. Wholeheartedly, I welcome Dr. Jayanti P. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Nidhi, for that uh, wonderful introduction. So without much delay, we'll move to the topic. Uh, today, the topic given to me is infections. We have uh, three different type of infections and three different chapters in your textbooks, like bacterial infection, fungal infection, and viral infection. Each of it is very important from the exam point of view, but because we are short of time, I, I have only one hour to cover all these three topics. I'm only going to concentrate on the exam, frequently asked exam questions and how do you answer. And I'll also give you some short uh, important uh, points that you remember about each of these infections so that it is very easy for you to reproduce and remember the clinical features and treatment. Because once you know how this disease occurs, then automatically you can uh, think yourself and write the clinical features and treatment. That's how it works because it's very difficult for any human being to remember so much of information. You need memory. Yes, of course, that is important from exam point of view. But there are some things which if you understand very clearly, 
you can just think and write the answer because when we study uh, tables in uh, first grade and second grade i always used to wonder th why they are asking us to memorize so many tables 2 into 2 is 4 2 into 3 is 6 why is that important because later on when we go to higher classes it is fixed in our mind that 2 into 2 can be only 4 it cannot be anything else once you know that 2 into 2 is 4 then working on higher mathematical calculations becomes very simple. That's how knowing the basics is very, very important. You understand the basic concept about each of these infections, then remembering that clinical features also becomes very easier for you. So moving on to the topic. Yes. So if you have to call anything an infection, which means indirectly means that that particular disease is caused by a microorganisms. So I think in second year microbiology, all of you would have studied what is called the Cox postulate. So which means that just a second. So according to Cox postulate, uh, you know that you can call something an infectious disease only if you are able to isolate a particular microorganism from the diseased organism or from the diseased population. That's a very, very important key factor to call a particular disease as an infectious disease. So we can have three types of infections. Basically, it can be bacterial, fungal, or viral. So first moving on to the bacterial infections, I'm going to deal with only three important bacterial infections, which is very important from the exam point of view, actinomycosis, congenital syphilis, and scarlet fever. So first about actinomycosis, it's a chronic separative granulomatous infection. Now, when you say something, a granulomatous infection, it means that histopathologically, you are able to see collection of chronic inflammatory cells, that is your lymphocytes and plasma cells, along with macrophages and Gen cells. Only when you have all these cells histopathologically, you can call it a granulomatous infection. And a typical example of that being tuberculosis. Now, actinomycosis is also an, another example of granulomatous infection. It is caused by a bacteria called actinomyces israeli. Now, if you see the word mycosis itself means it is fungi. So many students and many of them used to get confused whether it is a fungal infection or bacterial infection. Now today, fix it in your mind that this actinomycosis, though it has the term mycosis, it is not a fungal infection, but it is a bacterial infection. So if it is a bacterial infection, then why are we using the word mycosis? Because in very earlier stages, when uh, the scientists and microbiologists analyzed this organism, they found that the morphology of the organism had a lot of filaments and branches, which is a very characteristic feature of a fungi. So usually you see branching filaments only in a fungal organism, not in a bacteria. So initially microbiologists thought that this particular organism is a fungal organism and they named it as actinomycosis. But they later realized that this is not a fungi, but it is a bacteria, but still the old name is retained. So please keep in mind that it is not a fungal infection, it's a bacterial infection. And the unique feature of this bacteria is it is a filamentous branching bacteria. And that is why the other name for this bacteria is called ray fungus. So it may be an important viva question for you. Anyone ask you what is ray fungus? The answer is actinomyces is called as ray fungus because morphologically it resembles a fungi. So 
I already told you, there are three different types of actinomycosis. One is called the cervicofacial type, then you have the pulmonary type and the abdominal type. But the most important and the common one is the cervicofacial, which affects the uh, head and the neck region and of course the oral cavity also. So how does the bacteria enter into the oral cavity? The bacteria is entering through any form of mucosal abrasion or if there is barrier is lost, only then the bacteria can enter into the oral cavity. So the main portal of entry are the extracted socket, periodontal pockets and mucosal abrasions. These are the three important ways by which the bacteria is entering into the oral cavity. So uh, this is how classically it will look like. You can see from the clinical picture here, this is a very classical appearance of cervicofacial actinomycosis where the patient is having an indurated swelling. The meaning of induration is it's hard. When you palpate it, it's very hard. So you have an indurated swelling in the posterior region of the mandible in the angle of the jaw area. And you can clearly see some pointing areas here. They are nothing but abscess which are having a draining sinus opening. And through the sinus opening, you get yellow colored discharge. And that yellow colored discharge is typically called sulfur granules. That is nothing but collection of microorganisms. So you have a sinus opening on the skin and through the sinus opening, you get yellow color discharge, which is called the sulfur granules. When you examine the sulfur granules under the microscope, you're able to see nothing but collection of actinomyces microorganism. And most of the times it's a recurrent infection. It keeps coming and it then again, it's recurrent. And that is why that induration happens and it may spread to the adjacent parotid gland it may spread to the adjacent other tissues and even the underlying bone also it can spread. So when it is spreading to the underlying bone, there can be infection of the bone and bone marrow. That's what is called osteomyelitis. So actinomyces can cause osteomyelitis of the jaw bones. So if you take biopsy of this particular area, what will you see? I said it's a chronic granulomatous inflammation, which means in the periphery, you see there is collection of lymphocytes, plasma cells, because any chronic inflammation, you will see these two types of cells, lymphocytes and plasma cells. If you have to call it granulomatous, along with lymphocytes and plasma cells, you need to have two other important cells, that is your macrophages and multinucleated giant cells. And that's what you see here, multinucleated giant cells, all that is seen in the periphery. But what is more important in the diagnosis of actinomycosis infection is, you have to be able to detect the organism itself under the microscope. So what you see in the center here is the organism, actinomyces. This organism or bacteria is floating in a sea of neutrophils. So you have a sea of neutrophils in that the organism will be floating. And how do you know that it is actinomyces organism? It will have a very characteristic morphology. What is that? The central area will be hematoxophilic. You can see the blue area in the center. And the peripheral area will be eosinophilic or pink color. So a central hematoxophilic filament with peripheral eosinophilic club, that is how a typical actinomyces organism will look under the microscope. So if you are able to identify the organism in a sea of polymorphs, and of course surrounded by an area of chronic granulomatous inflammation, then you know that you are dealing with actinomycosis. So what is the treatment for this disease? There are a lot of abscess and uh, sulfur granules are getting drained from the sinus. So surgical debridement has to be done and all the abscess and pus has to be drained from that area and the sinus tract opening has to be excised. So basically surgical debridement has to be done. That is not enough because it's a bacterial infection along with surgical debridement, antibiotics have to be given. Penicillin is the drug of choice for actinomycosis infection. If patients who are allergic to penicillin, alternatively erythromycin can also be given. So this actinomycosis is a very, very important five mark question that has been repeatedly asked in most of the university paper. So you have to write all these points. That is what is actinomyces, the name of the organisms causing it, then the clinical features, the type of actinomycosis, how do you identify it histopathologically and of course the treatment. Don't forget the treatment. All this, your diagnosis, your clinical features, everything is because you want to treat the patient. If you don't know the treatment, then there is no point doing any of this. There is no point in diagnosis. There is no point in knowing the clinical features. So don't think it is an oral pathology subject. So treatment is not needed. If you see all the old question papers in the last five years, they have specifically asked the treatment also 
If a essay question is asked about trigeminal neuralgia, the question will be like, what is trigeminal neuralgia? Write the clinical features, diagnosis and treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. So answer is complete only if you write the treatment. So therefore you should know the treatment for all the diseases, including your infections. So you know what is actinomycosis. Now we will move on to the next infection, syphilis. Okay, syphilis is, you all know, it is a sexually transmitted disease. Basically, it is caused by a spirochete. That's a spiral shaped organism, which is called Tryponema pallidum. So you not only get syphilis by sexual contact, but also by direct contact with the lesion, any particular lesion. When someone has a direct contact, you get it. And of course, you have something called congenital transmission. So what is the meaning of congenital transmission? From the infected mother, it can spread to the child within the uterus also. That is also possible, which is very, very important from the dentist point of view. So if you take the entire uh, clinical features of syphilis, first time when the bacteria is entering into the uh, body, human body, the first stage is what you call the primary syphilis. Okay, that's called the primary syphilis. Then the lesion that is produced in primary syphilis is called chancre. So you can get both genital lesion as well as you can get the oral lesion. This chancre is nothing but a painless ulcer. Yes. And even if you don't do treatment also, within three to six weeks, it will heal by itself. And after that, it proceeds to the next stage. That's called the secondary syphilis. In this stage, patient has usually a generalized enlargement of the lymph nodes. Lymph node enlargement will be present. Fever, sore throat, low-grade uh, fever, all this will be present. And in the oral cavity, we have three important features in secondary syphilis. That is number one, you will have mucosal rashes, erythematous rashes are present. Then you have a proliferative growth, which is called condyloma lata. And then, of course, you have ulcers, which are called snail tract ulcers. Okay, these are three important characteristic oral manifestations that you see in patients with secondary syphilis. And from there, it will enter to a stage called latent syphilis. Latent syphilis is a stage where patient does not have any symptoms. They do not show any signs and symptoms of the disease clinically. However, the organism is remaining inside the human body. And in around... 28% of the people, this latent syphilis stage will progress to the next stage that's called the tertiary stage. In tertiary stage, the important oral manifestation is a lesion called gamma. Gamma is nothing but a proliferative lesion that is usually present in the tongue or the palate. And that is the characteristic lesion of tertiary syphilis. And very, very important is patient can develop cardiovascular and also neurological complications in tertiary syphilis. So we have three important stages in the development of the disease, the primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, and the tertiary syphilis. Now we will move on to the important one, congenital syphilis. This is very frequently asked as a three mark question for you, the features of congenital syphilis. I already told you from the infected mother, the bacteria or the spirochete can spread through the placenta into the child that way of transfer is called transplacental root and it can produce infection in the newborn child. So if the child is born with the infection, then you call that disease as congenital syphilis. You have two type of manifestations in congenital syphilis, early and late. So in early, within first two years of life, if the manifestations occur, it is called early syphilis. That's because of direct bacterial infection itself. Whereas after two years, about two years, if a child is getting clinical manifestation, then it is called late congenital syphilis. That is not because of the bacterial infection. That is most commonly because of hypersensitivity reaction due to the bacteria and the bacterial products. So what are the symptoms of congenital syphilis? That's what we are going to see. In the early disease, you have so many different symptoms like jaundice, thrombocytopenia, rashes, then radiographic changes within the bone, lymphadenopathy. But the most important one out of all this is rhinitis, which is also referred to as snuffles. That is the child will be constantly having running nose. That feature is referred to as snuffles, which is a very, very important sign of an early congenital syphilis, early disease. Whereas in late disease, Again, we have a lot of signs and symptoms, but the most important ones I've underlined in red color, which is Hutchinson's teeth, mulberry molars, interstitial keratitis, and eighth nerve deafness. 
So all these features together, which I have highlighted in red, they are called as stigmata of congenital syphilis. So stigmata of congenital syphilis means these are the very, very prominent features that is very obvious, which helps us in the diagnosis of congenital syphilis. That is rhinitis or snuffles, frontal bossing, saddle nose deformity, Hutchinson's teeth. The meaning of Hutchinson's teeth is the central incisor will be peck-shaped. The cervical portion will be larger and the incisal area will be narrower, resulting in a peck-shaped central incisor that is called Hutchinson's teeth. And the molars will have a lot of occlusal protuberance resembling like a mulberry fruit. So that's called a mulberry molar. The patient will have interstitial keratitis, that is the cornea will be affected, that's called interstitial keratitis. And eighth nerve deafness means the eighth cranial nerve or the vestibular cochlear nerve will be affected, resulting in deafness. Now, these three features, that is the involvement of the teeth, Hutchinson's teeth, with the interstitial keratitis and eighth nerve deafness, these three together is called as Hutchinson's triad. Triad means three features. Hutchinson is a person who first described it. So this is called Hutchinson's triad, which is a very, very characteristic feature of congenital syphilis. Now this Hutchinson's triad can be asked as a viva question, or it can be asked as a three mark question for you. So you should be able to write that it is a feature of congenital syphilis. And the three important aspects of Hutchinson's triad are involvement of the teeth, which is called Hutchinson's teeth, interstitial keratitis, that is involvement of the cornea, and involvement of the eighth cranial nerve resulting in deafness. That's what eighth nerve deafness. So these are the important features of congenital syphilis. Again, it's a bacterial infection. So the drug of choice is penicillin. So both for actinomycosis and syphilis, it can be easily treated if you diagnose it correctly because penicillin is the drug of choice. If you give penicillin in the right dose, the disease can be cured. Third and the last one among bacterial infection, which is important to you people is scarlet fever. So the name only tells you the clinical features of this particular disease. Scarlet means red color. Fever means rising temperature, body temperature. So the patient is having increased body temperature, that's fever, along with erythematous rashes on the skin. Because of these two features only, the disease name only given as scarlet fever. So it's a systemic bacterial infection caused by a bacteria called streptococcus pyogenes. What is, why you get this rash here, skin rash is because this bacteria is a gram positive bacteria. You all know that. So the gram positive bacteria will produce exotoxins. So the streptococcus pyogenes produces an important exotoxin called erythrogenic toxin. This toxin has an important feature is that it damages the endothelium of the blood vessels. As a result of that, the small blood vessels are undergoing dilatation, resulting in this erythematous rash. That is the pathogenesis of scarlet fever. That is the exotoxin produced by the bacteria damages the blood vessel endothelium, producing the erythematous rash. And how does it spread from one person to the other person? By direct contact or by respiratory droplet. So it's very common in children. The incubation period for the scarlet fever is three to five days. So you all incubation period is in any infection. Very, very important is incubation period. That means that when the bacteria is entering a particular person, how long does it take for the clinical signs and symptoms to develop? That period is called the incubation period. So in scarlet fever, the incubation period ranges between three to five days. And it starts with fever because any type of infection, whether it is bacterial, viral, the important clinical indication of infection is fever, raise in body temperature. So fever is common for all type of infections. Okay, so in scarlet fever also you get fever. And because this organism grows in the oropharyngeal region and multiplies there, patient gets pharyngitis, tonsillitis, along with cervical lymphadenopathy. And I already mentioned that erythematous skin rash is a very, very important feature of this disease. And this is how it will look like. It will be bright red in color. It will start in the trunk region and from there it will spread to the hands and the legs. And the erythematous rash will have a sandpaper consistency. So when you touch that area, of course, you're not supposed to touch it because it is highly contagious. But after wearing the gloves, when you try to palpate and touch the area of erythematous rash, we have a sandpaper texture. 
So you all would have felt how a sandpaper looks like a rough, right? Same way, this erythematous rash also on the skin will have a sandpaper texture. That's a very characteristic feature of scarlet fever. And wherever you have skin folds, it may be near the elbow or near the hip area, wherever there are skin folds in those area, you will get a red color line or rash will develop very prominently in that area of skin fold. That red lines are referred to as pastia lines. Okay, so pastia lines are nothing but the rash that develops in the area of skin fold in scarlet fever is what you called as pastia lines. What is very important to us as dentist or oral pathologist is the oral findings in scarlet fever. So what happens in the oral cavity? We have two important findings in the oral cavity. One is called the strawberry tongue. The other one is called the raspberry tongue. So the strawberry tongue, as you can see from the picture here, you all have seen a strawberry, how it will look like. It's bright red in color and there is a lot of pinpoint elevations, right? And that's how the tongue will look like in scarlet fever, which is described as strawberry tongue. So the tongue will be bright and red erythematous with the filiform and fungiform papilla are becoming enlarged. So that is giving an appearance of a strawberry fruit. So this is called a strawberry tongue. After some time, what happens? A white coating will develop on the tongue. So the bright area will disappear. The tongue will be white in color, but still the papilla will be enlarged. So this appearance is called raspberry tongue. That's because how the raspberry fruit will look like. So the two characteristic oral manifestation that you see in scarlet fever is strawberry tongue and raspberry tongue, which is very, very important from viva point of view. Okay, so next moving on to The complications and treatment of scarlet fever. So once you don't treat it properly in the later stage of the disease, it may spread, the infection may spread to the other areas of the oral cavity and the head and neck region, and it may result in peritonsillar abscess, sinusitis, sinusitis, otitis media, pneumonia, meningitis, and because it is a streptococcal infection, I think you all are aware of the two important complications of streptococcus pyogenes, acute glomerulonephritis and acute rheumatic fever that can also occur in patients with scarlet fever. And of course, like all the other bacterial, gram-positive bacterial infection, penicillin is the drug of choice. You can also give cephalexin. And patient who is having a bright erythematous skin rash, topical antibacterial ointment like mucipressin will help in the reduction of this rash. So we have completed the bacterial infection now. We will move on to the next important topic, viral, sorry, fungal infections. So I'm going to only discuss a very important fungi today, which is very, very important. Almost all the question paper have asked this question that is oral candidiasis. So before we go to oral candidiasis, I want all of you to know that fungi is a eukaryotic organism. It occurs usually in two forms. One form is called the yeast form. So you can see from the picture here, yeast is nothing but a unicellular or a single cell, which is oval in shape, okay? That is a unicellular organism form is called as the yeast form. But when this undergoes budding and it grows into a filament and hyphae, then that form is called mold form. So therefore two forms of fungi exist. One is the yeast form, which is on the left hand side. And the other one is mold form, which is on the right hand side. So mold is nothing but it is in the form of filament and hyphae. Now you need to know about something called dimorphic fungi. What is dimorphic fungi? Some of the fungi can occur in both yeast form and hyphal form, but only one form is pathogenic to humans. Okay, so I will tell you an example for that. Candida albicans, which is a causative fungal organism for a disease called oral candidiasis, is actually a dimorphic fungi, which means you have both yeast form and hyphal form. But the hyphae form is the form which is producing disease in human beings. Okay, so that's an example for a dimorphic fungi. 
and other than candida albicans you have other less common species of candida like candida crusae candida tropicalis and candida glabrata all these candidal organism please remember they are all normal oral flora which means that every one of our mouth is having this candida but all of us don't get candidiasis why why only in some people candidiasis occur that is what is called opportunistic infection so what's the meaning of opportunistic infection is that whenever the organism is getting an opportunity a chance that's when the organism will invade into the mucosa and cause the disease candidiasis in all the other human beings it will not produce disease so what is the chance and opportunity that the organism is waiting for reduced immune response of the host or in other words when the person is having immunocompromised state or immunosuppression for a longer duration then that is the chance the organism is waiting for in such situation the fungal organism which is normally present in the mouth will invade into the mucosa and it will produce oral candidiasis that is why in patients with hiv infection you all know hiv infection is a immunosuppressive condition those patients have oral candidiasis very commonly because immunosuppression is a very very contributing important factor necessary for the development of oral candidiasis Samar Naik is a very famous microbiologist. In 1991, he has given a classification for oral candidiasis. So, according to him, oral candidiasis can be divided into two types: primary candidiasis, secondary candidiasis. So, what is the meaning of secondary candidiasis? Is that if patient is having some systemic muco mucocutaneous disease. as a result of that you get oral candidiasis then you call it secondary candidiasis whereas primary candidiasis is patient does not have any systemic disease only oral manifestation is present in primary candidiasis we have four types acute chronic candida associated lesion and there are some white lesions which are super infected or super imposed with candida so under acute you have two types pseudo membranous and erythematous in chronic you have three types pseudo membranous erythematous and an additional type which is called hyperplastic type and candida associated lesions are dentistomatitis angular keilitis and median rhomboid glossitis now we'll see all of this in detail so the first and most important type and the most common type of oral candidiasis is pseudo membranous type so you can see the picture here very very classic appearance like a curd like appearance that's how the description is given in the textbook which means that it will be white in color first and it will be scrapable which means you will be able to remove it with the instrument most commonly seen on the tongue but you can also see it in the buccal mucosa but most often seen on the tongue like in this picture so it is called pseudo membranous candidiasis which is the most common presentation of oral candidiasis how you will differentiate it from leukoplakia which is also a white patch Leukoplakia is a non-scrapable white patch, whereas pseudomembranous candidiasis is a scrapable white patch which has curd-like consistency, which is most commonly seen on the dorsum of the tongue. The second important type of oral candidiasis is erythematous type, which is red in color. Erythema means red. Okay, it's so a red in color. So you have different types of erythematous candidiasis, or in other words, erythematous candidiasis will occur in different forms in different people. one form is this is how it will look like that is their tongue will be bright red in color and then when you take a biopsy or any smear you will be able to appreciate the candidal hyphae histologically that's how you know that it is erythematous candidiasis this is most often seen following long term antibiotic use because when you use long term antibiotics all the bacteria will be inhibited so the normal oral flora fungi that is present in the oral cavity will start growing and multiplying and that may cause oral candidiasis so this is specifically referred to as antibiotic sore mouth why is it called antibiotic sore mouth because most of the times this type of erythematous candidiasis occurs following long term use of antibiotics so it is called antibiotic sore mouth so when someone tells you antibiotic sore mouth don't get confused it is nothing but it is a form of erythematous candidiasis the second form is angular keilitis so in the angle of the mouth or the corner of the mouth there is redness cracking and dryness this condition is called angular keilitis it can occur because of candidiasis that is one reason but not always angular keilitis is because of candidiasis 
you may have angular chelitis but it may be due to other reasons also so what can be the other reasons for angular chelitis it can be iron deficiency vitamin b12 deficiency or even without any infection at all if the vertical dimension is less for a person then also you will get angular chelitis so don't think that angular chelitis means it is always because of candidiasis there are so many different reasons for angular chelitis but one important reason is erythematous candidiasis so that's the second form what is the third form that's called median rhomboid glossitis so you can see from the picture here very characteristic appearance in the dorsum of the midline of the tongue there is one area which is devoid of papilla and it is red in color okay so it is called median rhomboid glossitis that is also now considered to be a form of erythematous candidiasis if you see schaefer's textbook median rhomboid glossitis is mentioned under developmental disturbance of the tongue why now you are not calling it developmental disturbances but you are calling it as candidiasis is because if it is a developmental disturbance it should be mostly seen in younger age group and children when compared to adults but when scientists and authors did a lot of study on median rhomboid glossitis they analyzed a lot of people who had median rhomboid glossitis it was most commonly seen in adults and not in children so they had a doubt if it is a developmental disorder you are supposed to see it mostly in children but it is contrary we have got the result most of the times it is seen in adults so they had a doubt maybe it may be candidiasis so they did a scraping smear from it they did biopsy from the lesion they were able to identify candidal hyphae under the microscope and also when you apply topical antifungal agent over this lesion this lesion disappeared all this are proof that this is candidiasis so though the name is median rhomboid glossitis it is not a developmental disorder it is now considered to be a form of erythematous candidiasis so the other modified name for median rhomboid glossitis is chronic atrophic candidiasis that's the other name for median rhomboid glossitis the fourth form of erythematous candidiasis is dentous stomatitis which means that this typically occurs in the denture bearing area of patient who is wearing an upper denture so you can see the picture here totally edentulous area patient had a history of wearing the denture if they don't clean the denture properly they continuously wearing it even at night and they don't brush and clean it properly then the fungal organisms can grow and it can produce erythematous candidiasis that is typically called as denture stomatitis so there are four different forms of erythematous candidiasis one is called antibiotic sore mouth the second one is called as uh, angular chelitis the third one is median rhomboid glossitis and the fourth one is dentus stomatitis all these are types of erythematous candidiasis the third important type is hyperplastic candidiasis this one is also called candidal leukoplakia so don't think that it is a type of leukoplakia no the name candidal leukoplakia is given because clinically it is resembling leukoplakia which means hyperplastic candidiasis occurs at a non scrapable white patch similar to leukoplakia so many times clinically it's very difficult for us to differentiate whether it is leukoplakia or candidiasis so how can you differentiate biopsy so you take a biopsy if you are able to demonstrate fungal hyphae and this lesion resolves after antifungal then you call it hyperplastic candidiasis but if patient is having a history of tobacco chewing you have a non scrapable white patch you took a biopsy you see dysplastic features in the epithelium then you call it as a leukoplakia so two different features clinically similar but etiologically different and histopathologically also it is different so only histopathology will tell us the difference between hyperplastic candidiasis and leukoplakia so when you go to the lab diagnosis of candidiasis again lab diagnosis of candidiasis itself can be asked as a five mark question for you so very very important for any lab diagnosis you need to have two aspects one is specimen collection you need to collect some specimen from the patient right after that that specimen is used in different methods to identify the organism so what are the specimen that you will collect for oral candidiasis if it is a pseudo membranous type you will prefer to do a smear that you do a scraping from the white area and you can make a smear on a glass slide and then you can do some staining whereas in hyperplastic and erythematous type it is better to do a biopsy because smear will not give you any proper results so both smear and biopsy can be used as specimen in case of oral candidiasis 
Now you got this specimen with you. What are the detection methods that we use? The first method is called 10% KOH smear. KOH stands for potassium hydroxide. So what is this? You made a smear and then you apply 10% potassium hydroxide over that smear and then look under the microscope. So this is how you will see. You will see the fungal hyphae here. All these li um, lines that you see here are nothing but fungal hyphae. Only thing is disadvantage of this method is that this cannot be stored for a longer duration and later, maybe after three months or four months, if you want to go back and see this, it is not possible. It is an instant method. The advantage is it is very easy to perform, simple to perform. Immediately, you can get the results probably within 15 minutes. That's the advantage of this method. However, it is not a permanent way we can store the slides here. So the better methods are to do a routine H&E staining. Even in that also, the fungal hyphae can be detected. I think you all can appreciate this hyphae that is seen here, eosinophilic hyphae. So in a routine eosin and hematoxylin stain, the candidal hyphae will appear as a eosinophilic hyphal structures in the epithelium. Usually it is seen in the superficial layers of the epithelium. But sometimes it is very difficult to identify if it is very small sized hyphae. That times you can rely on special stains. Two important special stains are available for fungi, especially candida. One is called periodic acid shift stain, PAS stain. In PAS stain, the fungal hyphae will appear as magenta color hyphae. You can see that bright magenta color hyphae. So rather than having a light pink color stain like in HNE, if you can have a bright magenta color stain, it is very easy for us to identify the hyphae. The second important special stain is called a silver stain. Silver stain called, name of the stain is Grocot Gomari stain. So in Grocot Gomari stain or in any silver stain, the fungal hyphae will appear as black color area. So you can see this black lines, all these are candidal hyphae. So rather than doing a routine HNE staining, if you are able to do, if your laboratory is equipped with special stain like periodic acid shift or a silver stain like Grocot Gomari stain, it is very easy to identify the fungal hyphae. So either you do KOH staining or you can do a routine HE staining, PA staining or silver stains. These are the methods for looking under the microscope. But other than that, you can have something called culture methods. So in culture methods, the most commonly used culture media for any fungi is Chabroots dextrose agar, SDA. It's called SDA agar. So the candida will grow as yellow color colonies. Okay, you can see in the picture here, yellow color colonies. That's how the candida will grow in a SDA agar. You have different type of species, right? In candida, you have candida albicans, you have tropicalis, you have cruci. If you want to differentiate these different species, then you have some other type of agar called chrome agar. Chrome means color. Okay, So the chrome agar is also a culture media. This is mainly used for differentiating the different species of candidal organism. As you can see from the picture here, each of the species will show different color. Then you know based on that which type of species is causing it, whether it is tropicalis or cruci or albicans, you will be able to differentiate the species using chromagar. So other than staining and culture methods, you also have molecular methods for identifying fungal organisms like candida. You can use PCR, polymerase chain reaction, because all these fungal organisms will have DNA, right? So DNA can be identified using polymerase chain reaction. So even PCR can be used, but they are higher methods, expensive method, technique sensitive method. So if you have culture or routine um, special stains in your laboratory, that will be more than enough or ideal to diagnose oral candidiasis. So what is the treatment? If it is only in the oral cavity, in the tongue or in the palate, then you can give topical antifungal agents. Clotrimoxazole and nystatin are the most commonly used topical antifungal. But in patients like HIV infected patients, they may have oropharyngeal or esophageal or very extensive areas of candidiasis. In that case, topical uh, treatment will not work. So in such patients, you have to give in the form of tablets or systemic antifungals. The most commonly used systemic antifungals for candida is fluconazole and itroconazole. So that's about the oral candidiasis. So I think in uh, uh, Kerala University of Health Science, PUHAS, 
in fungal infections only oral candidiasis and histoplasmosis are included for your syllabus out of that candidiasis is one question that is very very frequently asked either a question can be asked about oral candidiasis itself as a eight mark question or lab diagnosis of candidiasis can be specifically asked as a five mark question so both of this you please understand and read up properly now we will move on to the last aspect viral infections now what i want you to know about virus is that in contrast to bacteria and fungi or any human being we all have the dna as a genetic material now the dna will be converted into mrna by a process called transcription mrna will be converted into a protein by a process called translation that's how it works for bacteria fungi and human beings but virus is unique because there are some viruses which have only dna there are some viruses which have rna as their genetic material a virus can never have both dna and rna together that is very very important feature of a virus so the viruses which have dna as a genetic material you call them as dna viruses the viruses that have rna as a genetic material you call them rna viruses example i will tell you now corona virus is an rna virus whereas uh, hiv is an rna virus herpes simplex virus human papilloma virus hepatitis b virus they are all examples for dna virus so just understand this main difference any virus will have a genetic material that is what is shown here in the center which can be either dna or rna covering the genetic material this pink area is called a protein coat that is known as capsid and covering that capsid you have a glycoprotein covering this blue color shell so that's what a virus will contain now, now this outer glycoprotein shell will have a lot of receptors glycoprotein receptors so any cell in the human body whichever is having a specific receptor for the glycoprotein in a virus the virus will enter into that particular cell or in other words every virus has a specificity to in, enter into a particular cell that property of a virus is called tropism which means that one particular virus has the capacity to infect a particular type of cell for example hiv virus can infect cd4 lymphocyte we all have studied about that in microbiology why because the glycoproteins present on the surface of this virus have a specific receptors on the surface of the cd4 lymphocytes so through this receptors they can enter into the cd4 lymphocytes and cause infection so every like that corona virus they have receptors for the lung cells okay so that is why they produce infection and pneumonia of the lungs so every single virus has an affinity to infect a particular type of cell and very 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 important feature of virus is what they are obligatory intracellular pathogens which means they are strictly intracellular whenever the virus is entering the human body immediately they have to go inside a cell they cannot survive outside the cell why because they don't have ribosomes they don't have atp generating mechanism that is mitochondria all these are not present in virus so if a virus have to survive if they have to multiply if they have to live they have to depend on a host cell therefore viruses are strictly intracellular they cannot survive outside a host cell so i am going to discuss about two important viruses today herpes group of virus and hiv which is very very important from exam point of view so the herpes virus which is infecting humans they are called human herpes virus hhv human herpes virus you have eight types of human herpes virus from type 1 to type 8 what is most important to us is type 1 and type 2 and type 3 type 1 is called herpes simplex type 1 type 2 is called herpes simplex type 2 and type 3 is called varicella zoster virus that's what is very important to us so this herpes simplex virus is a dna virus i already told you so i said every virus has an affinity to affect one or infect one particular cell so the cell that is infected by herpes simplex virus is a squamous epithelial cell and we all know that squamous epithelial cell are present on the skin in the oral mucosa and genital mucosa that is why the disease produced by herpes simplex virus clinically you see the lesions on these three sides you see it on the skin you see it inside the oral cavity and you see it in the genital mucosa 
you will not see it anywhere else because only squamous epithelium it can infect and squamous epithelium is present only in these three locations hsv1 will produce oral lesions and produce lesions on the skin above the abdomen whereas herpes simplex virus type 2 will produce genital lesions and lesions on the skin below the abdomen so we are going to talk about only herpes simplex virus type 1 it produces two type of infections now before we go into the type of infections produced by herpes simplex virus a unique feature about all the human herpes virus i showed you eight types right in a tabular column all these eight type of virus have a unique feature what is the unique feature is that first time when a virus is entering into the human body it will produce a disease that's called the primary infection first time infection so usually children only will get it because first time only children are getting exposed after some time the lesion is healing but the virus is not totally eliminated from the body the virus is still remaining inside the human body quietly in one particular area in the human body that period is called latency latency is a period where the virus is quietly sitting inside the human body without producing any signs and symptoms after some time what happens the same person may have some triggering factors or stimulating factors like what it can be a emotional stress or a exposure to uv light or it can be a severe form of immunosuppression or it can be a malignancy any of this disease whenever there is a triggering factor or activating factor the virus that is quietly sitting inside the body will get activated and that virus will start multiplying and again it will produce second time infection in the same person that is called secondary infection or recurrent infection so that is a very characteristic feature of all the herpes virus what is that first time the virus enters produces an infection primary infection then there is a period of latency where the virus is quietly sitting inside the human body without producing any signs and symptoms then after a triggering factor or a stimulating or activation factor it produces second time infection in the same person that's called recurrent or a secondary infection now when we talk about herpes simplex virus type 1 the primary infection can be in two forms one is herpetic gingivostomatitis the other one is herpetic pharyngotonsillitis now what is the difference if you get primary infection in children then you get herpetic gingivostomatitis as the name only tells you the lesion is seen predominantly in the gingiva and in the oral cavity whereas if you get primary infection in adults then it is in the form of pharyngotonsillitis which means the infection mainly will be in the pharynx and the tonsil whether it is gingivostomatitis or pharyngotonsillitis the clinical appearance will be the same what is the clinical appearance there will be multiple vesicles that is formed so you all know what a vesicle is dr deepu has already told you in skin lesion any fluid fill blister which is less than 5 mm in size is called vesicle so you will get multiple vesicles in the gingiva in the palate most of the times in the keratinized mucosa please remember herpes produces infections in the oral cavity most of the times the lesions will be seen in the keratinized mucosa that is gingiva and heart palate you can also see in other areas i am not telling it won't occur but commonly seen in the gingiva and the heart palate so patient will have multiple vesicles the vesicles will rupture it will be converted into ulcers and erosions along with this vesicles patients will have cervical lymphadenopathy fever malaise all the other features of infection in case of pharyngotonsillitis this vesicles will develop on the pharynx and tonsils they will rupture and it will convert into ulcers and erosion so patient has difficulty in eating food swallowing food mastication talking everything becomes very difficult because of pain and burning sensation so that's how primary infection will occur but what about after that the 2 2 to 3 weeks later even if you don't give any treatment it is all self healing disease self limiting disease after 2 weeks after 15 days the lesions will heal by itself no scar formation the lesions heal but the virus is not totally eliminated the virus herpes simplex virus is traveling via the trigeminal nerve because trigeminal nerve is only supplying the oral cavity so via the trigeminal nerve the virus will go to the trigeminal ganglion and it will quietly sit in the trigeminal ganglion that is called the latency period 
What happens after some time in the same patient if there is exposure to UV light or if there is trauma, malignancy, HIV infection, any other form of immunosuppression, emotional stress, hormonal imbalance, all these are examples for activating or stimulating factors. Then the virus that is quietly sitting in the trigeminal ganglion will get activated. They will multiply via the same trigeminal nerve. They will come back to the oral cavity and the lips and they will produce vesicles on the lips. That is called recurrent herpes labialis. So this is a secondary infection that is caused by herpes simplex virus due to activation. So again, you get crops or multiple vesicles commonly seen on the lips. The second type of recurrent infection is called herpetic whitlow. That is on the fingers and the nails, fingertips and the nails, you get vesicles. That is called herpetic whitlow. Most of the time, medical professional nurses and dentists get this type of infection because of the contact with the patients. This is also an example for recurrent herpes infection. So recurrent herpes labialis and recurrent herpetic whitlow are examples for secondary infection that occur after a period of latency. But all these are clinically characterized by formation of vesicles. So when you take a smear or a biopsy from that lesion, if you take a smear and look under the microscope, what will you see? You will see within the epithelium, there will be a split formation. That's called intraepithelial vesicle. And very, very important feature is Zang cells. So what are these Zang cells? They are nothing but all these virus infected cells. The virus is entering into the squamous epithelial cells. All these virus infected cells will combine together and it will form a multinucleated giant cell. That is called a Zang cell. And you will be able to appreciate this multinucleated giant cell under the microscope. And if you take a smear and identify it, the smear is called Zang smear. So a question can be asked, a three mark question about Zang smear or Zang cells. They are nothing but Zang smear is a smear you take from the vesicle fluid of a patient with herpes infection. When you look under the microscope, when you stain with eosin and hematoxylin and look under the microscope, the virally infected cells combine together and form a multinucleated giant cell, which are called as Zang cells. Also, the cells will be appearing as enlarged cell and shows a lot of degenerative changes. These changes are collectively known as ballooning degeneration. Why is it called ballooning degeneration? Because that cell is not a normal cell. That cell is infected with the virus. The virus is making changes within the cell. Okay, So the cell will become enlarged like a balloon and the cell is undergoing degeneration. So these changes are collectively known as ballooning degeneration. And these infected, virally infected cells are called as Zang cells. And the smear that you take to identify these Zang cells are called Zang smear. So please remember, just for your understanding, I'm telling the Zang smear can also be done in pemphigus. That also is called Zang smear because the same person only has described all this. So Zang smear can be done for two diseases. One is for herpes infections and the other one is for autoimmune skin disease called pemphigus. Both are called Zang smear and what you see under the microscope are called Zang cells. But in herpes infection, the Zang cells refer to the virally infected cell. Whereas in pemphigus vulgaris, Zang cells refer to acantholytic epithelial cells because pemphigus is autoimmune disease which causes acantholysis. So there, Zang cells refer to acantholytic cells, whereas in herpes infection, Zang cells refer to virally infected squamous epithelial cell. So the name is same, but the changes are different. So you have to clearly differentiate between these two. So in an exam, if a question is asked about Zang smell or Zang smear, you have to write about both the disease. You have to write about both pemphigus as well as about herpes infection. So how do you diagnose with a characteristic clinical presentation? You can take a Zang smear, histopathological examination. You can also culture the virus in a culture media. And last and most important is you can collect the serum from the patient and antibodies against the virus can also be detected. That is again, very important method of diagnosing any viral infection. 
See, there are two ways in which you can diagnose a viral infection. One is you directly identify the virus. That's the causative organism. Or the second method is called indirect method. What is that method? You are not directly identifying the virus, but the, when the virus is entering the human body, the human body will produce antibodies against the virus that can be detected in the blood or the serum. So you can collect the serum of the patient and you can look for the antibodies. That is also a confirmatory diagnostic method for viral infections. So even herpes simplex virus, the diagnosis can be made on serological diagnosis. That is you're looking for HSV antibodies. So how will you treat topical acyclovir ointments can be used for treatment. So varicella zoster virus is also a human, herpes, a human uh, herpes virus. It is also a DNA virus. Like how you have a primary infection and secondary infection in herpes simplex. Similarly, in varicella zoster virus also you have primary infection. Primary infection is called chickenpox. The other name for chickenpox is varicella. So what do you get in chickenpox? You get a lot of skin eruptions and fever. That's a very characteristic feature of chickenpox. Because skin eruptions and fever is very, very important. Now, after two weeks, the lesions will heal. But again, the virus will quietly sit inside the ganglion. And because of reactivating factors, the virus will come back again and produce a secondary infection. The secondary infection is called herpes zoster. So please remember, the primary infection caused by varicella zoster virus is chickenpox. The secondary or recurrent infection caused by the same virus is called herpes zoster. So you have to differentiate between these two diseases. So the histopathology of chickenpox and herpes zoster is similar to herpes simplex infection. So you have to take a smear, the same ballooning degeneration and the same Zan cells can be seen in both herpes simplex as well as in chickenpox. So last, I will conclude with infectious mononucleosis. Uh, it is also called glandular fever and kissing disease. Why is it called kissing disease? Because the virus can transmit from one person to the other person with the help of saliva. So it is very, very dangerous. It rapid spread can occur from one person to the other person. So by kissing, the disease can spread. So it is called as kissing disease. Why is it called glandular fever? Because the name only tells you the clinical features are enlargement of the cervical lymph nodes and fever. That is why the other name for infectious mononucleosis is glandular fever. And the virus which is causing this is Epstein-Barr virus. So the manifestations in the oral cavity can be palatal petechiae, necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, pharyngitis, and tonsillitis. And the test that is used for diagnosing infectious mononucleosis is Paul Bunnell test. So you all would have studied in microbiology about Paul Bunnell test. That is nothing but a serological test where antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus is detected. So if Paul Bunnell test is positive, then the patient is having infectious mononucleosis. Again, if you take a blood smear of these patients, you will be seeing atypical lymphocytes, abnormal lymphocytes in the blood of these patients. These abnormal lymphocytes are called downy cells. So a positive Paul Bunnell test to detect the antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus and the presence of atypical lymphocytes called downy cells in the blood smear. These are the diagnostic features of infectious mononucleosis. So, um, so I have covered the most important topics uh, of infections, both bacterial, fungal and viral. It's a very, very important topic, very frequently repeated. Most of it you would have studied in your second year microbiology. So uh, it is just a revision for you, but understand the basics of it and understand how each of this organism produces disease. Bacteria will produce disease using toxins. Virus is an intracellular pathogen. It will infect a particular cell. can yourself write the clinical features and treatment of each of these diseases. So we are short of time. So I am just uh, stopping now with this. I hope uh, I, I try to cover uh, the important questions already. But if something is left behind, I think we can, uh, uh, you can contact the organizers through WhatsApp. They will be able to help you. If there are any other doubts, I will take it. Otherwise, I would uh, take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, the organizers the organizing team of this program, exam alert, especially the Department of Oral Pathology, the management and principal of Anu Dental College for again giving me this opportunity to interact with the students. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a good day.
Thank you, Jayanti, ma'am, for a very informative session. That was a comprehensive session on infections. Thank you, ma'am, for a wonderful session. Moving on, uh, we are moving on to the next session. Uh, we have Dr. Mahesh Radhakrishnan for uh, discussing the topic dental caries. Uh, over to uh, Dr. Before I introduce this, uh, before I invite the speaker for the session, may I introduce uh, Dr. Mahesh? Dr. Mahesh complete, completed his BDS in 2006 from uh, Dr. M MGR Medical University and MDS from Minakshi University, Chennai in the year 2011. He has more than 10 years of UG and PG teaching experience and is presently a PG guide under the KUHS and has very many international and national publications to his credit. Dr. Mahesh attained the first position during staff assessment in the year 2013 and is currently working as an associate professor in KM City Dental College. With utmost uh, pleasure, I invite Dr. Mahesh to take over with the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir, you're audible. Okay. So I'll just start with the screen sharing. Sure, sir. Okay, uh, very uh, good afternoon. It's going to be around 12. Uh, uh, this is uh, a very important topic. It's a very vast topic. And um, today's topic is going to be dental caries. Uh, so before I start, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for giving me an opportunity. The head of the department, Nano Dental College, the principal and um, all uh, those who are working in the department associated with Anu Dental College. Um, so uh, before we uh, you know, waste any more time, we'll just start with this uh, topic. Okay, now let's go into uh, the frequently asked questions in this chapter. So uh, if you look at uh, this uh, chapter, uh, you will notice that most of the time in the question papers, you have three questions usually that get repeated. So the first, uh, the first question is uh, basically going to be your, uh, is basically going to be your, uh, the theories of dental caries. So that is one thing which they usually ask. And the second question is uh, the histopathology of enamel and dental caries. Uh, the third question is going to be your etiopathogenesis of dental caries. Okay, and in Vaiva, most of the time, the question that is uh, usually asked is your uh, definition of dental caries and the types of uh, caries, okay? So these are the usual questions that they ask. The questions keep repeating. And among the uh, theories of dental caries, the one which they frequently ask is your acidogenic Miller's theory, okay? So this class is um, going to be more concentrated on the fact that we are only going to discuss about the frequently asked questions and, uh, we, and I will just show you how you can present each of these answers when such questions are asked in the exam. So if you go into dental caries as such, caries is a Latin uh, word means rot or rotten. In Greek, it means death. And what you need to know about dental caries is that dental caries is a multifunctional or multifactorial disease. And you have the, you need a presence of a host, you need a cariogenic microflora and a diet that is conductive to enamel demineralization. So what you need to know is that the caries as such, you know, for caries to uh, happen, it is not a particular agent only that is responsible, but it's multifactorial. So there is a definition for uh, dental caries. Okay, this definition is frequently asked in the Viva question. So there are certain things which I've put in this definition, which I have put in bold letters, to make you understand the importance of each and each line in this definition. So here, dental caries is an irreversible microbial disease of the calcified tissues of the teeth, which is characterized by demineralization of the inorganic portion and dissolution of the organic substance of the tooth, which leads to cavitation. 
Okay, so it's irreversible. So what are the key words which you need to know? It's a microbial disease. That's the first thing. It's irreversible. It affects the calcified tissues. You have demineralization, and in end you have a cavitation. Okay, so this is what. So these are the three things: irreversible, microbial disease, demineralization, dissolution. So whenever you use the, whenever you uh, write the definition, you you have to be uh, you have to be sure that you use these words or these terminologies while framing your answers. Now there are a lot of theories. So in the exam, uh, the question will be usually if in case a question is going to be asked on theories, it could either be an essay question or it could be a short essay question. Okay. Now sometimes the question would be like this in the exam: enumerate the theories of dental caries, and they would tell you to write about acidogenics or acidogenic theory, or they will write ask you to write about one specific theory most of the time it is your miller's acidogenic theory okay so when they ask you to enumerate the theories what do you need to write first of all you need to write all the names of the theories that are there so the theory begins with the legend of worm the endogenous theory which is called as a humoral theory then you have the chemical theory which is otherwise called as the acid theory then you have the parasitic theory or the septic theory and then you have the important ones okay The Miller's chemosetic, chemoparasitic theory, or the acidogenic, acidogenic theory, then the proteolytic theory, the proteolysis chelation theory, and then you have like sucrose theory and autoimmune theory. Okay, so first, what you need to know is that you need to study the names of the theories. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to do. So if a question of enumerate is asked, you need to learn the names of the theories. Okay, and in what is been uh, put in bold the those three three those three theories are the ones which are important so these theories are frequently asked and the most important is your miller's chemoparasitic theory or acidogenic theory because the miller's theory is the most accepted theory okay now how are you going to present an answer if this question is asked so you write in points okay now whenever you write an answer in oral pathology you know that when you when cysts and tumors and all these chapters are taken you have an order right you write introduction you have uh, the etiology you have pathogenesis and then you write about the clinical features you write age you write sex you write site clinical presentation then you go into the radiographic features histopathology and then the treatment okay but when you are writing a theory like this like for example a question like this is asked you have to be very sure that you are writing what is important because in the book itself you will notice that it is given as a story okay it's given in the form of a paragraph so in simple terms what is acidogenic the word acidogenic means there is acid okay so what it says is proposed by w d miller there are acids that are produced by micro microorganisms of the mouth and it involves two processes the first process is decalcification of enamel and dentin the number 2 you have dissolution of the softened residue and more importantly the acids that are produced are by the fermentation of starches and sugar from the retaining centers of the teeth okay so what it basically means in the next slide you will be able to see you have bacteria so in very simple terms in the exam they ask you acidogenic theory you can write the simple simple thing okay you just have to write this you just write bacteria plus sugars plus teeth that's going to result in the formation of acids and these acids are responsible for dental caries so it's simple so while valuing the paper you know if you're going to write this part bacteria plus sugars plus teeth plus organic acids and you write dental caries the person may not even read what you've written he just going to look at the main thing but what is important is write in points and don't write in paragraphs okay because if you write in paragraphs it be difficult for the examiner to find out the main points okay so whenever you write a theory you write the main points in it and use like this kind of you know uh, you give an arrow or you give a subheading and you try to uh, present your answers like this okay? so simple thing you need to remember bacteria sugars teeth and organic acids they give rise to dental caries okay now in this when acidogenic theory is asked you have three components that are involved Then we call it the triad. Okay, one is the carbohydrate substrate, otherwise called as the role of the carbohydrates. Second one, the role of the microorganisms, and third is the acid. Okay, so we'll be going. 
when we discuss about the ethiopathogenesis, we'll be going more into detail about each one of them. And now we will go one by one, carbohydrates, microorganisms and acids. So these three things, these three triads is something which you need to remember while writing the acidogenic theory. Now, the first one is the role of carbohydrates. Now, when they notice that, you know, their low caries index manifests increase in caries after exposure to refined diet. So you have in easily fermentable carbohydrates. You have, uh, you know, people who had more sugary food or those who have fermentable, you know, carbohydrates, they were more prone to caries or they found that they had more caries, okay? So we'll go into detail about what this means. So the cariogenicity, it depends on many things. So whatever I've underlined in bold is very, very important. Number one, it's the frequency. So how often you take the food? So if you're taking sugar, how often you're taking it? If there is an interval, it's good, but you're taking in frequent intervals, it's bad, okay? So the frequency of the intake is important. Number two, the physical form and chemical composition. Very easy. The physical form means if you're taking sticky food, you are taking solid food, okay? Then uh, you, you will not be able to, you know, you will not be able to, uh, the sticky solid food, you will not be able to, uh, it will not, it will easily get retained in the mouth, okay? So that is the one thing about uh, the sticky food being more retentive in the teeth. The third one is monosaccharides, disaccharides, they're more caries producing. And then you have the diet, okay? The diet that is high in fat and proteins, they reduce oral retention of carbon. That means your diet also plays a very, very important role in the cariogenicity of this, of uh, the, means the car carbohydrate cariogenicity will depend on all these factors. Next, you have the role of the microorganisms. So in the microorganisms, which comes in the, the that is the third, uh, you know, the second one, which comes under that, you have one is streptococci, uh, lactobacillus, acnomyces, and then you have ac the other, uh, other, uh, other uh, microorganisms, that is your velonilia, and then your other types of, you know, um, streptococcus, that is a mutant, sanges, meteor, malaria, acnomycosis, viscosis. So there are different types of microorganisms that are involved. So broadly, what we have is your streptococci. And then what we have is uh, mainly your, your uh, lactobacillus. Okay, so your advanced stages you have, or in the preceding, preceding stages you have lactobacillus. So the main one or the main... Uh, uh, the main, uh, you, uh, you know, the, the one which causes it is fundamentally your streptococcus mutants. Now, how uh, how did they come to know that you have, uh, you know, the caries is, you know, when they when they inoculated uh, streptococci in caries inactive uh, hamsters, they found that there is active dental caries. So it shows that uh, there is, uh, you know, dental caries, the streptococci. Uh, plays a very important role in the uh, in initiation and formation of caries. Okay. So here also you can see that you know uh, in rats you have a high cost, a high sugary diet. You they, you come to know that there is you know you have more of uh, dental caries. Okay. So all these uh, experiments concluded the, uh, uh, the that you know the streptococci in the mouth and that results in dental caries. Now, before we go into that one very important finding or a discovery that they let or they came to know was that the acidogenic strains of the streptococci, especially the S mutants, they had the ability to metabolize dietary sucrose. And they had this, there was a, there was a the material that was formed, which was called as blue can. And it was, uh, and you had this blue can, which has played a very important role. Now, what does this blue can do? The glucan is a sticky, slimy gel inert that is resistant to bacterial hydrolytic enzymes. And it causes the plaque to adhere tenaciously to the tooth surface. Now, the plaque is a very important thing, you know, because the plaque is actually a biofilm and it acts. So when these acids, they have to go and add it to the tooth surface, they need a medium. And the glucan is, uh, you know, it's a slimy substance and it allows this, uh, you know, this plaque and uh, the uh, plaque to 
stick into the thing and this thereby helps in the retention of these uh, caries. The next one which comes is the role of acids. So the second first one what we discussed was the role of microorganisms. So we discussed, uh, first one was role of carbohydrates where we discussed about the uh, role that is the sugar, where, uh, the frequency, the, so the physical forms. The second what we discussed was the role of microorganisms. In the role of microorganisms, what we discussed was about the streptococci, okay, the main, uh, the microorganisms that are involved, okay. And the third, now what we're discussing is about acids. Now, acids, you have acids produced because of the enzymatic breakdown of sugar. The main acid which is produced is lactic acid. And then you have streptococci, lactobacilli, what they do, they ferment sugar, we have more of lactic acids. And these acids, the plaque which is there, they act as a medium for holding the acids. So in simple terms, if we look at it, you have the carbohydrates. In that, you have the bacterial action, you have enzymatic breakdown happens, and you have formation of acids. You have acids, mainly lactic acid, butyric acid, mainly lactic is the one, and the, lo and the localization of this acid is upon the tooth surface. That is by the way of plaque, which I'll be discussing a little later when we discuss about etiopathogenesis. So what acid you need to remember, which is produced is the lactic acid lactic acid which is produced, okay? So that's what you need to remember. So in the role of acids, the key point you need to remember is about lactic acid and the enzymatic and enzymatic breakdown which leads to these acids. And these acids, they get localized onto the tooth surface. Now in simple way, if you look at the whole process of that in the Miller's acidogenic theory, you can notice that you have basically the decay that is causing the bacteria that is the carbohydrates is involved, there is sugar that is involved, and then you have acid, thereby you have mineral loss and thereby demineralization. So in a simple step, you could, uh, you will have an idea about how the whole mineralized process takes place. So that's why we said that in acidogenic theory, you have the role of the microorganisms, you have the role of the uh, carbohydrates, and you have role of acids. So the combination of all these things, three things result in demineralization, and thereby you have tooth decay. So you just write few points on each one of these, that is role of carbohydrates, role of microorganisms, and role of acids. So in um, acidogenic theory, you need to remember these three subheadings, and you can present the essay very easily. The next question is your proteolytic theory. The proteolytic theory, again, what it says is, it says that the dental caries is a proteolytic process, and here, the microorganisms, they invade the organic pathways. Okay, the organic pathways are, are uh, they invade and they destroy the enamel. And the acid formation will accompany proteolysis. So basically, organic portion, mainly it is your enamel lamellae and your rod sheet. And they have a role in initiating the dental caries. Okay, so how, what, how are you going to remember this? Proteolytic means you're going to remember proteolytic process and the microorganisms are invading the organic portion. Okay, that is what you're going to remember. Okay, so, and the organic portion of the tooth, that is enamel lamellae rod sheet, they have a role in the initiating carry. So only a few points which you need to write. Next is your protease and chelation theory. Okay, by Scarts and Martin. Now, what did they say? They said that my, simultaneously microbial degradation of the organic components and dissolution of the minerals of the tooth is by the process something known as chelation. So you have chelation. Chelation means you have chelates that are formed. So you have, so what is chelation? Chelation, nothing but the process of involving the complexing of a metallic ion to a complex substance through a coordinate covalent bond resulting in a highly stable compound, okay? So you have a chelate that is formed Okay, and it forms a stable compound, which is a chelate, and that is responsible for the caries. So what it means is not acid itself, because it's independent of the pH median, and the removal of the metallic ions, because of the formation of this compound, which is the chelate, results in removal of calcium, and that occurs at neutral or even alkaline pH. So you need to remember about the, you need to write the process about chelation, you need to write about the chelate, that is the compound that is formed, and you need to write about, that is, uh, you need to write about the effect of the chelation. So that proteolytic chelation theory, okay? 
the second one was proteolytic theory okay where you so you remember about proteolysis and you remember about the organic pathway in this if they ask proteolytic uh, proteolysis chelation you write about the chelate what is chelation and you write about the effects of chelation so that's what you need to basically write down okay now next one what we go is we're going into the etiopathogenesis of dental caries so now we just discussed about the caries that is we discussed about the different um, um, we discussed about the different theories the most three important theories in that the most important one i told you is acidogenic theory where you need to write about those three things the base, basic triad now to understand the um, you know the if you want to understand the uh, the etiopathogenesis so you need to understand that you need to know about what is plaque okay plaque uh, something about what is dental plaque you might have heard about plaque so what is plaque plaque is a thin tenacious adherent film on the tooth surface and it is basically composed of mucin you have desquamated epithelial cells and you have microorganisms so you have you have all these thing of of it's basically a biofilm that is there okay now plaque is having a very important role in caries because what caries what plaque does is that the the oral streptococci which is there it uses their capsular slime of the plaque and it adheres that uses that to adhere to the surface of the teeth so it you know so this is acting like a medium the plaque is acting like the medium so the streptococci can go and attach itself or bind to the tooth surface so that is the importance of the plaque okay and as i told you bark is consists of all these components so it's a very complicated portion of the bacteria that grow as a biofilm on the enamel surface so plaque is very extremely important now when we discuss about plaque what we need to know is about something which is called as a stephens curve so basically what this person called stephen what he did what he found out was he found that the rate of drop in the plaque ph following a 10% glucose rinse obtained by plotting the plaque ph value against a time interval okay now what in simple terms what it means is that i'll show you in the di next diagram you can see that when the person consumes sugar okay in a frequent interval the down is a time period the sugar you could see that the ph slowly starts decreasing okay so there is a decrease in the ph so as the interval is there the ph slowly so more and more sugar is consumed in in you know in less period so frequency is less consumed more you take more sugar there is a slow decrease in the ph okay and what we call in this is what you need to understand is what is called as a critical ph so what happens is that usually when the ph reduces to around 5.5 now that happens when when you take sugary food the frequency of the sugary food there is no interval okay for example now you have you have a carbohydrate say in the breakfast or something in the morning and between you don't have any sugary food it's fine but if say somebody is consuming sugary food in between okay and so what eventually happens is that you see that as he consumes more and more sugar the ph value keeps reducing and as it reduces and once it goes below 5.5 you have demineralization so below 5 ph you can see demineralization so that is what is called as basically called as the critical ph okay so this is basically called that curve which is there is called as the stephens curve so this is again you know um, you need to know that the frequency of having a diet which is more which is sucrose and the interval between having the carbohydrate or the sugary diet is very important because the more frequently you take it and the interval is less the chances of ph coming down is more and then that is going to initiate your demineralization so this is a very uh, this again the same thing you know the critical ph and the time taken interval you can see once the ph is down down the critical ph you're going to see increase so you 10% glucose rinse and then the time interval you're going to definitely see the ph coming down and then slowly is going to initiate demineralization so this chart most of them would have you would have known about this chart it's a very uh, very common uh, this chart about the etiology and this is a very it's a triad actually which involves basically the tooth it involves the flora and the substrate okay and this is the basically etiological chart which is there okay the tooth the flora that is the microorganisms the, uh, and then the substrate which is basically the carbohydrate the sugar 
all those things and many other factors which are there in this so we'll slowly discuss one by one about all this what uh, what these uh, three are what role does these three things have now you have another thing which has been included in the triad which is actually called as it's become a tetrad actually because you have time also that's been included because it's very important because the time uh, the frequency okay the frequency of ingestion of food which is of uh, carbo high carbohydrate content okay the time frame that is also important so in the new thing it's basically a tetrad where they include the diet the tooth the microorganism the time all these factors together they are responsible for the you know your uh, your uh, the ectopathogenesis so that is these three these four factors are now um, you know ones which influence the formation of dental caries now we discussed what is the contributing factor so i'm not going to go one by one i'm just going to tell you the main things in this so the contributing factors i told you one is tooth the second one is saliva the third one is the diet so in the tooth now how does it play a role now you have tooth basically the composition the morphology and the position of the tooth so in simple terms you know fluoride content more in the surface enamel and hence it's more resistant to decay so fluoride content surface enamel it's more resistant so that makes a difference the morphology of certain tooth now you have a tooth in the posterior your molars are more prone to caries because why because your molars are having they have the pit and fissures and the pit and fissures they're more liable to decay so depending on the morphology of the tooth also that also depends on the influence of the of, of getting caries the position of the teeth if you have crowding rotation of the teeth okay you have something like that then they won't be efficient cleaning of the tooth won't be there and then thereby you know you have inefficient plaque removal and then the plaque is indirectly going to contribute to dental caries there are other factors also okay so one by one these are the basic factors one is the composition of the saliva the, the second one is the ph of the saliva third is the quantity fourth is antimicrobial and buffering capacity okay so composition as you know saliva is very important because normal saliva plays a very important role so if you have certain conditions where your saliva is decreased like in xerostomia okay in those cases saliva is decreased and thereby people who are having less saliva they are more prone to dental caries okay so we have a caries which is called as radiation caries so people undergoing radiation they are going to have caries because they are more prone to xerostomy so in those cases you have more caries in these people so in saliva itself has a lot of functions which are already studied in your first year it has antibacterial properties you have lysocyanin all these things lactoferrin they all antibacterial so when your saliva decreases for some reason it's going to affect your it it is going to definitely have a role in influencing the caries formation your ph your ph your saliva more because your saliva carries out the clearance as the salivary down decreases or saliva ph is going to so buffering capacity of the saliva that's what we mean saliva has buffering capacity so maintaining the ph is extremely important quantity i told you certain conditions you're going to have decreased saliva so that's again going to be a contributing factor for dental caries then viscosity so more viscous saliva it's going to be again more prone to caries okay and then of course which we discussed about the buffering capacity that is i we already discussed about that okay so these are the factors the tooth uh, you know uh, the positioning of the tooth and the morphology of the tooth and the saliva factors these three factors are going to be important along with that the diet which we discussed in the first theory the diet if a person is having a diet which is more of carbohydrate more sugar refined food they are going to be more prone to caries say a person who is having a diet which is protein and fat okay it's they are going to be less poor so diet is playing plays a very important role okay what kind of diet you have then you have certain deficiencies like you know for example you have vitamin deficiency deficiency okay and uh, you have say you have you have you know it's going to affect your tooth mineralization process thereby you could have enamel hypoplasia and all that okay and of course you know your the um, the local factors also and along with that fluorides so you have fluorides fluorides as you know it is having anti cariogenic property so all these factors together they play an important role in influencing the formation of caries okay so this is the basic fundamental i'm just cut it short fundamental things you need to know that is you have the triad which is there you have the tooth you have the microorganism you have uh, the diet and you have the time so all these four factors you just need to write a few things 
And of course, you need to write the role of the pH, the role of saliva, all this one by one. Now, one important question next, which we are going to go to is your histopathology of dental caries. So this question is very, the most important question in this chapter is probably the histopathology because most of the time, the questions keep shuffling between histopathology of dental caries and histopathology of enamel caries, okay? So what you need to remember first when they ask you a question of histopathology of dental caries, you first need to remember the different zones, okay? So how you remember the zones? You have translucent zone, number one. You have dark zone, okay? This is for enamel caries. You have body of the lesion and you have surface zone. So you have four zones, okay? Now, how do you remember this? You have an uh, easy way of remembering it. It's called trained dentist is equal to a better salary, okay? Trained dentist is equal to a better salary. So trained T stands for translucent. Dentist D stands for dark zone. Better V stands for body of the lesion. And S stands for surface zone, okay? So if a question is asked in the exam for histopathology of enamel caries, what you need to actually do is that you need to remember the names of the zones first, okay? The translucent, dark, body of the lesion, and surface zone. And what you need to do is you need to write few points on each zone and you need to draw a diagram. That's all what you need to do, okay? And you can just use this thing from a train, then this is equal to better salary. So you will know TDBS, okay? These are the things which you can, which will help you remember it. Now, first is the translucent zone. It's the first recognizable zone. It appears structureless. Okay, location, deeper zone or advancing front. Porosity is more and larger than normal enamel. The volume of space is 1%. And the demineralization is seen in the junction of prismatic and interprismatic enamel. Okay, so one few things you need to write. First is first recognizable zone. Okay, it appears structureless. Okay, it's basically the advancing front. Okay, the translucent zone. You can write about the, the porosity, 0.1. Okay, and few. So few, three, four lines about each of these zones. Okay, so advancing front of the lesion is very important. It's not always present. The translucent zone is not always present. Okay, that's the first zone. The second zone is the dark zone. Why it appears dark is because of the excessive demineralization. So that's the first point. So whichever I put in bold, all those points you need to, you need to, uh, you need to highlight. Okay, each of these points you need to highlight. So the one one is the excessive demineralization which you're going to see in this zone. And then of course it's a positive zone because of the excessive demineralization. And the location, it's basically located superficial to the translucent zone, okay? So, and the pore volume is around two to four percent. So the excessive demineralization is something which you need to underline and you also need to underline the positive zone, okay? So you go to the diagram, it's adjacent to the translucent zone. And the second thing you need to remember that it is a positive zone because you have, it's basically because of demineralization. That's why it appears dark in color. The next one is a body of lesion. So the body of the lesion, you have the greatest demineralization that is seen, okay? It's between the dark and the surface layer of enamel. The pore volume is 5%, 24% at the center. And you have demineralization both in the peripheral and central areas of the organ. And then what you see here is you see the accentuation of the stri of ridges can also be appreciated, okay? So what is the main point in this is it is the greatest demineralization is seen in the body of the lesion, okay? So you have to remember about the pore volume. You need to remember the location that is it between the dark zone and the surface. That's all these things you need to remember. But most importantly, you need to write that this is the area which is having the greatest demineralization. Okay, the zone three, which is otherwise called as the, otherwise called as the body of the lesion, okay? So this is the area of greatest demineralization. Next one is the surface zone. It's basically comparatively unaffected. It's around one to 10% of loss of mineral salts are seen. Pore volume is less than 5%. And you can see some amount of, because it's least affected, it's on the surface. You can see some amount of remineralization in the surface. Okay, so it's the surface zone, which is the most superficial zone. Now, this is a diagram which you all are aware of. You probably would have studied this in your manual. So this is a diagram which you have to draw in, in case they ask you in the exam. Okay, so what you're going to do, you're going to write these four zones. You're going to remember, okay, these four zones, the translucent, trained dentist is equal to better salary. Okay, T is translucent. Okay, so uh, D is your dark zone, D is body of the lesion, and then your surface zone. So T, D, B, S. Okay, write few points about each of these zones. And then after that, you draw a diagram. 
okay this diagram is very familiar you just have to draw these diagrams so this is a five mark question which they'll ask you very very important question histopathology of dental caries okay next one we go into the histopathology of dental caries again the zones either the question will be asked as histopathology of dental caries or they're going to ask you zones of dental caries very repeated question for a five mark again in this also you need to remember you have five zones so in the first when you study something you remember how many zones are there total in the other one you had four zones in this you have five zones so first zone is patty degeneration of toms fibers the second one is dental sclerosis the third one is decalcification of the dental tubules the fourth one is microbial invasion and the fifth zone is when you have advanced dental caries that is your decomposed dentate okay so first you need to study the names of the five zones okay how do you remember is you can use fdd md okay f stands for fatty degeneration of toms d stands for dental sclerosis again decalcification of dental tubules m stands for microbial invasion and d stands for decomposed dentin or otherwise the advanced dentinal caries okay so five zones are there for dentinal caries whereas for enamel caries you have only four zones now we go one by one into each of these zones first one is zone of fatty degeneration of toms fibers you just have to write only few points one is you have deposition of frat globules that precedes the early sclerotic changes okay you have frat globules that have been deposited and then what the fat it contributes to impermeability and it may be a predisposing factor for dental sclerosis so you have sclerosis what sclerosis does is tries to create a seal you know so that it doesn't allow the portal entry of the microorganisms into the pulp okay so you have uh, uh, you have this first one uh, it is the one which is preceding the sclerotic change now the second zone is what we have the sclerotic so first is fatty degeneration just before the sclerotic you have the fatty degeneration and then you call dental sclerosis or transparent dentin formation and what i told you sclerotic it what it does is it basically seals off the dentinal tubules from further penetration of the microorganisms so this is the second zone which is the zone of dental so from the word dentinal sclerosis itself you're going to get an idea about what you need to write in this zone the third one is the zone of decalcification very very important so what in decalcification what you see is you need to write occurs in the advance of the bacterial invasion and what you're going to see is you're going to see microorganisms okay penetrating and that penetration of the microorganisms before any clinical evidence of caries process that's what called as pioneer bacteria so in the zone 3 if they ask you what do you need to remember is that you need to write about pioneer bacteria okay which you see that is you can see this penetration or bacterial invasion in the dentinal tubules okay when you notice this that and that is basically what is called as the pioneer bacteria okay and that time you don't see much of clinical evidence okay that shows that there is involvement of dentinal tubules and you will also you will notice that the dentinal tubules are filled with microorganisms you're going to see a lot of microorganisms in the dentinal tubules in this zone 3 okay so very important zone so here is what called as a pioneer bacteria which you see which you see in the dentinal tubules which is again a gone and invaded these dentinal tubules okay so in these cases you know you may not see clinical evidence of dental caries they can decalcification the walls of the dental tubules you can see these tubules are filled with packed of microorganisms the next one is a zone of microbial invasion so you have proteolytic enzymes proteolytic organisms sorry as seen in the deeper caries and you see acinogenic organisms which are present in the prominent early caries so you see a full of microorganisms in this in the in this in this zone the last one is the zone of decomposed dentin which is otherwise the advanced dentinal caries it's the outermost zone you have complete destruction of the dentinal tubules so as you proceed to the zone 5 you will see a complete destruction of the dentinal tubules and you will also notice that you have these dentinal tubules um, you know decomposition along the direction of the dentinal tubules just like you know you have the caries in the direction of the enamel rods just like that you have this uh, decomposition of dentin happening in the direction of the dentinal tubules and this is referred to as liquefaction cocci of miller okay now one thing you need to remember is in zone 3 you need to remember, remember you need to write about pioneer bacteria and in zone 5 you need to write about liquefaction cocci of miller so you have to be you need to remember that in this zone you need to write that and you also need to mention about the transverse clefts that are present in the zone that are bacteria filled clefts that are there 
Now you have an advanced resist, show you some pictures in advanced renal caries. You can see the tiny liquefaction foci. You see breakdown of the few dental tubules, necrosis in the dental tubules. Okay, this complete destruction of dental tubules in advanced dental caries. And of course, you can also appreciate the transverse clefts. Okay, the transverse clefts also can be appreciated. So if you go to advanced renal caries, you'll be able to see all this. Now this diagram you're very much fond of, it's there in the textbook, in the manual. So you can draw this diagram. So you write the five zones, you write few points about each of these zones, okay? And then you draw a diagram. Okay, this is the most easiest diagram which you can draw, okay? You can draw the decomposed dentine, microorganisms that are there in the dental tubules, some transverse clefts, and of course, the Miller's for of liquefaction degeneration. You can draw this diagram in the exam. So very important that even for zones of enamel caries, you draw a diagram. And for zones of dental caries also, you have to draw a separate diagram, okay? So remember the names of the door zones, and you remember one or two or three points which you need to, you know, include in each of these zones. Okay, so very very important that you know you study in you study in detail about you study in order. Okay, you study in order for so that you remember in the you'll be able to remember in the exam. So I'm just going to conclude. I'm not uh, this. So what you need to remember in this uh, in this uh, topic. Okay, first thing is that you need to study the definition of dental caries. The definition is very important. Uh, it's going to be asked in the viva, so very easy definition. So remember the main points, you need to use the word irreversible, you need to use the word demineralization, dissolution, okay, all these words you need to use while mentioning the, uh, while mentioning the definition of dental caries, okay. The theories have, have been asked as an essay question, and in the theory, so they ask you to enumerate, you, are, you write down the names of all the theories. Enumerate means you just mention the names, okay? And then they ask you specifically about each one theory, you write about that. So remember, if they ask you to enumerate, don't write all the theories in detail. Just write the names, and then you look at the sub-question what is asked, okay? So enumerate will have separate marks, and then you have the sub-question which will have more marks. That is, they most probably it will be your acidogenic. Okay, acidogenic theory, otherwise called as Miller's, Parasitic theory or what is chemoparasitic theory. Okay, all these different different names for astrogenic theory. Okay. So this is a possible essay question from this chapter. Then etiopathogenesis. So etiopathogenesis, you just remember that petrard. Okay. You need to remember about the substrate, okay, the tooth, the what do you say, the composition, the frequency, all these things you can write together. The time. Okay, you can include all that in your etiopathogenesis. So when you write about etiopathogenesis, you see that you use, you don't forget to write the tetrad, okay, all those factors that are going to influence the formation of dental caries, okay? And last, very, very important, this is that most of the question papers, histopathology of dental caries. You have enamel caries and dental caries. In enamel, what do you need to do? You need to write the zones, write few points under each zones and draw a diagram, that's enough. It's very important that you draw a diagram, okay? And this is the most important question, okay? While you study my oral path, one thing I just like to tell you is that you have, um, you are in this chapter specifically, you have um, many types of caries, which I have not discussed because, you know, that's a huge topic, okay? So there are frequent questions, some questions which they ask, okay? For example, root caries, okay? Because root caries is caused by acnomycosis, viscosis, okay? And you need to write some. So they'll ask you maybe radiation caries, okay? So because people, people who are having uh, for, who are having radiation, they have xerostomy and then they are more prone to caries, okay? Sometimes another question they ask is arrested caries, okay, arrested, okay? That means there is no, there's no progression of the caries is stopped because of what's called as hibernation of dentine, okay? So few of the caries repeatedly been asked, but most important ones are the ones which I discussed now, okay? So just go through the, all the different types of caries also from Pitt and Fisher, to, you know, rampant nursing bottle, all that. So that's going to take a lot of time to discuss each one of them in detail. But what I discuss now, these few questions are most important for you in the exam. One thing you need to do is you start preparing early. Don't wait for the last minute because your exam is in January. You have to start preparing early itself. You need to read a couple number of times. Discuss with your uh, friends, okay? Oral pathology is the one subject which you will forget very fast. You read something, you'll, you won't remember anything. So what you could do is you could discuss it with your friend. You could ask your friend to tell you the answer so that you know you, the chances of you are getting, re, you know, recollecting is much more, 
okay so try to discuss and study oral pathology and revise revision is very important you need to revise this a couple of times before you go for your exam by reading it once you're never going to remember anything always remember that so keep revising and revising again and again so once you revise the subject is going to be easy for you and then i would like to um, thank um, the department of oral pathology and urdu college the principal dr jiju sir for giving me an opportunity thank you very much thank you sir for your excellent presentation it was quite an informative session on dental caries thank you sir moving on the next session is on osteomyelitis introducing the speaker dr niruba thomas is working as reader in anu dental college muvattupura she has an experience of 6 years she graduated from rajas dental college in 2003 and completed her post graduation from anu dental college in 2015 she completed certificate course on young adult guidance and counseling from fuhas university she has guided ug projects under icmr in the year 2019 She has various national and international publications. With great pleasure, I welcome Dr. Nirupa Thomas. Thank you for your kind introduction. Good morning, dear students. My topic for today's discussion is osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis is an important topic for your exam. the usually asked essay question is define classify and discuss in detail osteomyelitis the commonly asked short notes are condensing osteitis and garis osteomyelitis or chronic osteomyelitis with proliferative periostitis let's start today's session with the definition of osteomyelitis osteomyelitis in uh, Osteon is a Greek word which means bone and myelos means marrow itis means inflammation so osteomyelitis is the inflammation of bone and its marrow contents this is the simple definition of osteomyelitis the proper definition is osteomyelitis is an inflammatory condition of bone that usually begins as infection of the medullary cavity and rapidly involves the haversian system and quickly extends to the periosteum let's see what are the etiology and pathogenesis of osteomyelitis osteomyelitis is initiated through hematogenous root in long bones and this is initiated as infection in the jaws in the jaws mainly the etiology of osteomyelitis are odontogenic infection trauma and the infection derived from periostitis after gingival ulceration this osteomyelitis is more common in the mandible compared to maxilla the let's see what are the reasons or why this is common in the mandible this is because the mandible is more dense bone compared to maxilla and uh, the vascularity is very poor the blood supply from the inferior alveolar neurovascular bundle is the only uh, vascular channel for mandible but in maxilla there is excellent blood supply from multiple nutrient feeder vessels and this maxilla is a less dense bone that permits the dissipation of edema and pus into the soft tissue and paranasal sinuses these are the reason why this osteomyelitis is less common in the maxilla let's see what are the predisposing factors there are several predisposing factors involved in osteomyelitis but the three important factors are host resistance virulence of microorganisms and alteration of jaw vascularity host resistance means our immunity if the immunity is less then more chances of osteomyelitis and the microorganism is if the microorganism is more virulent then there are more chances of occurrence of osteomyelitis and and it also depends upon the vascularity if less vascular then more chances of osteomyelitis 
other predisposing factors which uh, in which the osteomyelitis has been associated are high diabetes autoimmune disease agranulocytosis leukemia severe anemia malnutrition syphilis cancer chemotherapy steroid intake sickle cell disease and aids in certain conditions the vascularity of the bond Uh, may alter and that condition leads to the onset of osteomyelitis these conditions are radiation osteoporosis osteopetrosis pages disease fibrous dysplasia bone malignancy bone necrosis caused by mercury bismuth and arsenic let's see how this osteomyelitis occur in our jaw bones mainly this osteomyelitis is due to the inoculation of bacteria into the jaw bones and how this bacteria or uh, what is the root of this bacteria or how this bacteria enter into the jaw bones these the roots are through the extraction of caries tooth or by root canal therapy or due to the fracture of maxilla or mandible through these roots the uh, bacteria enter into the jaw bones let's see what are the steps involved in the pathogenesis of osteomyelitis first inflammation occurs in the marrow tissue then the inflammatory exudates spread through the marrow spaces uh, at that time additional leukocytes are recruited to the area to fight the infection and pus may develop at that time and this uh, due to the development of pus there will be elevation of the intramedullary pressure so uh, there will be decrease in the blood supply to that region and the pus travel through the havertian and wolfman's canal then spread through the medullary and cortical bones then the pus perforate the cortical bone then it collects under the periosteum Uh, so that the periosteal blood supply is compromised this aggravates the local condition and causes osteoclastic activity this the bone resorption starts and bone necrosis happens that is the dead bone that is known as sequestrum and this sequestrum at that time it separated from the surrounding vital bone that is vital bone is known as involucrum this osteomyelitis is a polymicrobial infection that is numerous microorganisms are involved in the osteomyelitis this various microorganisms involved are streptococcus mycobacterium and protozoa these are the three important microorganisms in osteomyelitis other microorganisms which can be seen in culture are echinella klebsiella pseudomonas and proteus mycobacterium tuberculosis and trichoderma pallidum and actinomyces can also be seen in the culture of um, osteo culture uh, in osteomyelitis case next is how to classify osteomyelitis osteomyelitis can be broadly classified as separative and non separative osteomyelitis and the separative osteomyelitis can again be classified as acute separative osteomyelitis and chronic separative osteomyelitis the non separative osteomyelitis can be classified as chronic focal sclerosing osteomyelitis chronic diffuse sclerosing osteomyelitis chronic osteomyelitis with proliferative periostitis or garis osteomyelitis let's see different types of osteomyelitis in detail If you prepare a box like this then it will be easy to remember. So let's see the difference between acute separative osteomyelitis and chronic separative osteomyelitis. In acute and chronic separative osteomyelitis the port of entry of this infection is different. In acute os- separative osteomyelitis main entry is through caries lesion or pulp infection or fracture of jaw. but in chronic separative osteomyelitis this is mainly due to the delicately treated acute osteomyelitis or it occurs from dental infection without a preceding acute stage or it occurs as a complication of radiation 
both these acute and chronic separative osteomyelitis can occur at any age and acute separative osteomyelitis can occur in the mandible or maxilla even in neonates this acute separative osteomyelitis is seen but chronic separative osteomyelitis is commonly seen in the mandibular molars and let's see what are the clinical features in acute and chronic case acute separative osteomyelitis the patient will have severe pain trismus and paresthesia of the if the mandible is involved and the involved tooth is loose but in chronic separative osteomyelitis the pain is less severe and teeth may not be loose pus may extrude from the gingival margin in acute separative osteomyelitis but in chronic separative osteomyelitis the separation may perforate the bone and the overlying skin or mucosa to form a fistulous tract and in acute separative osteomyelitis there is no swelling or reddening of the skin or mucosa until the periostitis develop but in chronic separative periostitis osteomyelitis there is swelling on the outer surface of the jaw so let's see what are the difference uh, in the radiographic features usually acute separative osteomyelitis uh, more thickened appearance can be seen in the radiograph but in chronic separative osteomyelitis there will be a ill defined radio lucency resulting in more eaten appearance sequestrum appears as islands and the involucrum is often found surrounding the sequestrum and uh, the histopathologic features are also uh, different in acute separative osteomyelitis you can see the medullary spaces are filled with inflammatory exudate and uh, this uh, inflammatory exudate consists of polymorphonuclear leukocytes lymphocytes and plasma cells osteoblasts bordering the bony trabeculae are generally destroyed but in chronic separative osteomyelitis chronically inflamed fibrous connective tissue filling the trabecular area of the bone can be seen and uh, acute separative osteomyelitis is can be treated with antibiotic uh, correction and evaluation of host defense deficiency is also important but in chronic separative osteomyelitis the administration of antibiotic is not enough so large uh, sequestrum should be removed surgically and small sequestrum usually exfoliate through the mucosa Let's see the difference between chronic focal sclerosing osteomyelitis, chronic diffuse sclerosing osteomyelitis, and chronic osteomyelitis with proliferative periostitis or Garry's osteomyelitis. There are synonyms for chronic focal sclerosing osteomyelitis, that is, uh, condensing osteitis, and the synonym for chronic osteomyelitis with proliferative periostitis is Garry's osteomyelitis or periostitis ossificans the portal of entry of uh, the chronic focal sclerosis osteomyelitis is carious lesion or pulp infection but in chronic diffuse condition it is periodontal disease in garis osteomyelitis it is through carious lesion and this type of reaction is endosteal sclerosis in chronic focal sclerosis and chronic diffuse sclerosis osteomyelitis but it is periosteal sclerosis in chronic osteomyelitis with proliferative periostitis and the age of occurrence is also different in chronic focal sclerosis osteomyelitis it is below 20 years of age because there is high degree of tissue resistance and uh, here the proliferation happens rather than destruction but chronic diffuse sclerosis osteomyelitis usually occurs in older people and uh, garis osteomyelitis occurs before the age of 25 and the location of chronic focal sclerosis osteomyelitis usually large carious lesion seen in first molar but in chronic diffuse sclerosis osteomyelitis it is seen in edentulous areas and chronic osteomyelitis with proliferative periostitis or garis osteomyelitis is commonly seen in the mandible that is premolar molar region 
and clinical features are slightly different. Mild pain is seen in chronic focal sclerosing osteomyelitis, no other signs and symptoms. But in chronic diffuse sclerosing osteomyelitis, there is mild separation and insidious pain, fistulas opening and uh, vague pain or bad taste in the mouth can be seen. But in Gary's osteomyelitis, toothache uh, or pain in the jaw can be seen with bony heart swelling on the outer surface of the jaw. Then the radiographic features are also different. In chronic focal sclerosis osteomyelitis, you can see well circumscribed uh, radio opacity at the apex of the root. One root or um, both roots can be affected and their root outline can be visible visible and the border uh, is diffuse or distinct. Widened periodontal ligament space can also be seen. But in chronic diffuse sclerosing osteomyelitis, uh, this apex of the root is radio opaque, bilaterally seen and uh, maxilla or mandible will be affected. Diffuse patchy sclerosis that is cotton wool appearance with indistinct borders can be seen. In uh, Gary's osteomyelitis, uh, in occlusal radiograph, you can see focal overgrowth of the bone on outer surface of the cortex. Duplication of the cortical layer of the bone can be seen. So here you can see a well circumscribed radio opacity. Here you can see a cotton wool appearance and here you can see duplication of the cortical layer of the bone. And, uh, when you look into the histopathologic features, in chronic focal sclerosing osteomyelitis, you can see dense mass of bony trabeculae with little interstitial marrow tissue. And bony trabeculae exhibit reversal and rusting lines. This indicates bone resorption and bone uh, repair happens. Fibrotic and uh, this is infiltrated by small number of lymphocytes. In chronic diffuse sclerosis osteomyelitis, dense irregular trabeculae of the bone can be seen, which is bordered by a layer of active layer of osteoblast. Reversal and rusting lines can also be seen, which indicates resorption and repair. In chronic osteomyelitis with proliferative periostitis, reactive newborn formation and osteo tissue can be seen. Osteoblastic filming can also be seen. These trabeculae are perpendicular to the cortex and parallel to each other or in a rectiform pattern. This connective tissue uh, is fibrous and diffuse sprinkling of plasma cells and lymphocytes can be seen. So, uh, the histopathologic features are different in all these cases. Coming to the treatment part, uh, in chronic focal sclerosing osteomyelitis, uh, we can uh, go for endodontic treatment that KDS2 uh, can be endodontically treated or extracted and surgical removal of the sclerotic lesion is not indicated unless it is symptomatic. And in chronic diffuse sclerosis osteomyelitis, the resolution of focae of infection lead to the improvement of the lesion and antibiotic administration is necessary. Uh, but in Gary's osteomyelitis, the tooth can be treated endodontically or extracted. There is no need of surgical intervention for periosteal lesion except for biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Otherwise, uh, this antibiotic treatment is enough. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. So, prepare well for your exams. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nirupa, for the comprehensive presentation. Up next is a very relevant topic, diseases of nerves, which is to be handled by Dr. Lakshmi Venugopal, Senior Lecturer, Annu Dental College and Hospital, Muatibura. She pursued her master's degree in oral pathology and microbiology from the Mar Vesilis Dental College in 2017 and BDS from Kurg Institute of Dental Sciences in 2011. Apart from completing two certified courses under the KUHS on research methodology and also in medical education, Dr. Lakshmi has got various publications in state and national levels. I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Lakshmi Venugobal to deliver the topic on diseases of nerves. 
Over to you, ma'am. Good morning, all. Thank you for the kind introduction. Today, I'll be dealing with the topic diseases of nerves. In that, I'll be concentrating on uh, two most important or frequently asked questions that is, trigeminal neuralgia and Bell's palsy. You will get for a short essay. Neuralgia actually derived from a Greek word and it is nothing but the pain in the distribution of nerves. There are different types of facial and cervical neuralgias that is atypical facial pain, migraineous neuralgia, occipital neuralgia, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia, etc. In that, we will be concentrating on the trigeminal neuralgia. As the name suggests, this trigeminal neuralgia affects the trigeminal nerve, that is the fifth cranial nerve. And it has got many synonyms. Uh, one is tic dolorex. That term I will be discussing in the coming slides. Also, it is called trifacial neuralgia. This trigeminal nerve has got three divisions. That is ophthalmic division, maxillary division and mandibular division. And this trigeminal neuralgia involves more than one division. It is also called as trifacial neuralgia. And also for the gills disease because this is put forward by a person called for the gill, hence the name. Trigeminal neuralgia follows the anatomic distribution of fifth cranial nerve that is the trigeminal nerve and it is limited to one or more branches of trigeminal nerve and mainly affects the second and third divisions that is more commonly affected branches are maxillary and mandibular divisions. Here is the pictorial representation of trigeminal neuralgia and this is the nerve uh, and this is the ganglion associated that is the Gesserian ganglion and this has got three divisions ophthalmic division, maxillary div division and mandibular division and these are the uh, affected areas of each division. This is affected area of uh, ophthalmic division, this is the maxillary division and this is the mandibular division affected areas and uh, among the three more commonly affected divisions are maxillary and mandibular divisions. Also, the trigeminal neuralgia exhibits a trigger sort, that is the stimulation of particular area which initiates the paroxysm of pain, that is sudden onset of pain. And this pain will be accompanied by a brief spasm or tick. That brief spasm is called as tick. And this has got the highest suicidal rate of any disease because of the severe and intense pain. About the etiology. And the first etiology remains unknown. Hence, it is idiopathic or it could be due to any pathology along the course of the nerve or a tumor or infection in the brainstem area. Also, there will be circulatory insufficiency to the Gassarian ganglion or uh, a condition called multiple sclerosis. That is a loss of the protective covering or loss of myelin sheath uh, of the nerves uh, give rise to a condition called multiple sclerosis. About the clinical features, it occurs more commonly in an age group of above 40 years. Women are mostly affected. Right side of the face is affected more compared to left and as I told you maxillary and mandibular divisions are more commonly affected compared to ophthalmic division and this disease has got extremely severe pain and it is of unilateral in nature. There are certain area which can stimulate sudden onset of pain in this trigeminal neuralgia. Such areas are called trigger zones. Such areas include nasolabial fold, cheek, vermilion border, midfacial area and periorbital area. And there are certain factors that could stimulate uh, this kind of pain. 
that factors include even a mild touch or breeze or a gentle movement or it could be due to any eating or smiling and the patient learns to avoid touching the skin over the area and frequently he or she goes unshaven or unwashed to avoid any possible attack stage of trigeminal neuralgia the patient will experience only a dull ache or burning sensation it can resemble a sharp tooth ache and that stage is called pre trigeminal neuralgia as the stage advances or in the later stages uh, the pain will be more severe that is it could be any lancinating type of pain that is piercing type of pain or searing type that is uh, heavy pain or heavy intense pain stabbing type of pain that is sudden onset of sharp pain is stabbing type of pain it could be any electric shock type or lightning bolt type and this pain is initiated when the patient touches that trigger zones on the his or her face also the pain will be accompanied by a painful jerk because of the spasmodic contraction of the facial muscles and so the term tic dolorex is also given for trigeminal neuralgia because the word tic meaning painful jerk the one each attack of uh, trigeminal neuralgia lasts for even few seconds to few minutes and also there will be refractory period between each attacks and the associated symptoms uh, with the pain and the painful jerk are excess lacrimation conjunctival infection and also intense headache there are specific criteria for the diagnosis of this trigeminal neuralgia one is it will be abrupt in onset that means even a light touch to the triggering zone can stimulate sudden onset of pain also the pain will be severe paroxysmal or lancinating type that is a severe sudden onset of severe piercing type of pain and the duration of each attack will be less than 2 minutes also there will be a refractory period between 2 attacks and this refractory period lasts for several minutes and the pain will be limited to one or more branches of trigeminal nerve with no uh, involvement of motor function also the pain diminishes on taking carbamazepine medication and there will be spontaneous remission in this condition histopathology there are no any unique features for this particular disease this is a purely clinically correlated disease and if you go for histopathology we could see only fibrosis in the trigger points also there will be myelin degeneration even in the ganglion and in the nerve also the plaque formation can be seen in the ganglion area about the differential diagnosis that's the most important part the first differential diagnosis we could consider for a patient who comes with the symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia is nothing but the dental pain and it can be excluded by proper intraoral examination and history taking second differential diagnosis we could consider is migrainous neuralgia but it can be excluded by uh, asking the symptoms that is each attack of uh, trigeminal neuralgia persists only for several minutes but in case of migrainous neuralgia it persists for hours the second differential third differential diagnosis we could consider is uh, sinusitis but here trigger zones are different for uh, trigeminal neuralgia again costen syndrome also can be considered but in costen syndrome there will be associated symptoms like tinnitus otalgia and also dizziness and the last differential diagnosis we could consider is trigeminal neuritis or trigeminal neuropathy 
also in that there will be a pressure sensation or pulling sensation which lasts for hours or days or weeks so it can also be excluded now coming to the treatment it can be done by a topical application of capsaicin cream that is nothing but the substance p suppressor also anti convulsant medications like phenytoin carbamazepine and gabapentin can be given surgical treatment also can be done by removal of any bony irregularities peripheral neurectomy injection of uh, alcohol injection of boiling water or surgical sectioning of trigeminal sensory root again microvascular decompression these are the surgical techniques for the uh, treatment of trigeminal neuralgia it either it can be done by medical therapy or by surgical therapy according to the, according to the uh, clinical severity of the disease next topic we are going to discuss is bell's palsy Bell's palsy is the paralysis of the seventh cranial nerve of facial nerve. About the etiology, first etiology remains uh, idiopathic, that is not known. Again, trauma to the nerve, injection of LA to the uh, facial nerve can also cause Bell's palsy. Another reason could be ischemia of the nerve near the stylomastoid foramen area, that is a reduced blood flow of the nerve near the stylomastoid foramen area can result in the edema and compression resulting in the paralysis of nerve. Other reasons could be surgical removal of parotid gland, also it can be hereditary or reactivation of herpes simplex or herpes zoster in geniculate ganglion also due to multiple sclerosis i have already told you that is a condition where nerve demyelination occurs these are the possible or suggested etiologies for the bell's palsy certain predisposing factors are suggested for bell's palsy that include acute otitis media again atmospheric pressure changes that include diving and flying also exposure to cold or exposure to any local or systemic infection even in the trade third trimester of pregnancy due to early eclampsia that is a high blood pressure condition occurring pregnancy clinically there is no age predilection for the uh, bell's palsy women are more commonly affected childhood it is more seen due to viral infections or lyme disease or uh, sarcoidosis there will be unilateral paralysis of the facial muscle rarely prodromal pain is seen on the affected area the pain uh, will be seen on the ear temple mastoid area and angle of the jaw and paralysis can result in the drooping of uh, corner of the mouth and drooling of saliva can be seen also there will be inability to close eye this will result in infection of the eye also the patient can give a proper smile that's one of the sign for the obvious paralysis again mask like a appearance or expressionless face of the uh, patient there will be difficulty in speech eating and also there will be altered taste sensation and the condition will regress within weeks or months this is a diagrammatic representation of the bell's palsy patient here you can see the uh, drooping of eyes also loss of nasolabial fold and drooping corner of the mouth this is the diagrammatic representation of the clinical features of a bell's palsy patient and also there is a syndrome associated with bell's palsy that is the uh, triad of three uh, symptoms that is one is bell's palsy associated with keelitis granulomatosa and fissure tongue and that syndrome is called as melkerson rosendahl syndrome 
treatment can be done by uh, medications like histamine systemic corticosteroids hyperbaric oxygen therapy or again by surgical decompression for eyes we can give one a topical ocular antibiotics and artificial tears okay if you get a question like trigeminal neuralgia or bell's palsy for your shorter see first start with a small introduction then write for the etiology again uh, write the clinical features again if any associated symptoms present write that and after that uh, diagnosis part or if any histopathological features present write that also and conclude with the treatment and that completes your today's session thank you all thank you ma'am for your excellent presentation on diseases of nerves with this we are concluding the sessions now i invite our students dean professor dr jules paul head of the department department of periodontics for the closing remarks good afternoon all <clears throat> thank you doctor for that wonderful introduction respected principal anu dental college jiju george pp vice principal dr lisa george head of the department of oral pathology dr deepu speakers of the day and my dear students first of all first and foremost <clears throat> i would like to congratulate the department of oral pathology anu dental college for coming forward with such a great idea like exam tips now i have seen uh, these kind of programs being done for post graduate students you know in fact in all disciplines of post graduation these kind of programs are being done but i think this is for the first time that uh, this sort of this type of program is being done for undergraduate students now i know that um, these uh, different faculties we have wonderful faculties not only from our department but from all the uh prominent faculties in oral pathology from across the state who have come together and oriented you with the, the different aspects of uh, oral pathology in such a way that you know when you go for exams you are really confident and most of the topics that come for exam would have been discussed so i'm really happy that i'm overland that uh, you guys have been uh, bombarded with a lot of knowledge in oral pathology so that you are really confident The, there are a lot of uh, faculties who have come forward uh, to this program i know that most of them are very very busy but i really like to uh, thank those faculties especially uh, dr rakesh dr sutha dr sunil dr jayanti dr anthony dr jubin dr lakshmi priya and dr mahesh now apart from all these doctors you know we had uh, our own faculty dr deepu dr priya uh dr niruba and dr lakshmi so i like to thank uh, each of these faculties for sparing your time to enrich these students now the first session of uh, this program was done by our own principal dr jiju george baby now he is a key mom and uh, he highlighted about the different aspects of preparing for exams how to prepare notes how to approach exams how to approach why was what type of food you should take uh, how to take rest and uh, how to sleep and all those things were enlightened so i think you are uh, you you really know uh, how to prepare for an exam uh, uh, undergraduate exam now now we have had about 800 registrations though these 800 people never came together uh, to attend the lecture but we had 800 registrations and i am pretty sure that this uh, the whole of this program is available in the internet uh, it's available as youtube link and the whole of these lectures are archived in our own website that is our anu dental college website under aic that is anur initiative for curricular <coughs> excellence 
So uh, anytime, especially before the exam, you just ha can go and log into these sites and uh, you can see this video and uh, get the slides and you can prepare a note on that. And I'm pretty sure that this is just a beginning. The Department of Oral Pathology and Odell College will be conducting this particular program in a much, much larger scale with a national participation. And I can guarantee you that. And uh, as for the students, all the best, all the best, not only for exams, but for all your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nethi. That was the end of our day four, the final session of series of exam tips. I extend a warm gratitude to all those who have participated in today's session. Hope the series of exam tips were very useful for all of you. And we hope to conduct a similar series in the upcoming year, that too, in a national level. All the best for your exams. Thank you and have a nice week ahead. It's me, Dr. Nidhi and Dr. Veena signing off. Thank you.